Today's class is about the parable of the husbandman. It's the title, the parable of the husbandman. We're going to start with the book of Sirach 6 and 32. The book of Sirach, chapter 6 and verse 32. My son, if thou wilt, that thou shalt be taught. And if thou wilt apply thy mind, thou shalt be prudent. Right, so <clears throat> this scripture is telling you that you must be willing to learn. You must be willing to receive that learning. You're not going to be taught unless you allow yourself to be taught, right? It says you must apply thy mind. Notice the key word, apply, because it's not talking about knowledge here. It's going to start talking about wisdom in a little bit, right? We're going to talk about wisdom in a little bit. And remember what I said, the difference between knowledge and wisdom is wisdom is the application of the things you've learned and exercise of use in those things. So when it says apply thy mind, right, thou shalt be prudent, meaning you're going to take accountability for your walk and your learning. And like I've been bringing out the past few weeks, you're not going to study your way to it, right? It's the most high that brings that understanding to you. Not to say you don't study, but meaning in absence of everything else that we've spoken about, studying alone, like the way you study for an exam at school or something at work, is not going to get you to where you need to be. It's only going to take you so far, right? The, the, the spiritual aspects of the scriptures need to be given to you as a blessing, right? And remember, that's given as a proportion of your faith. So there's a lot of little steps within that as well. Come on, next verse. If thou love to hear, thou shalt receive understanding. And if thou bow thine ear, thou shalt be wise. Right? It says, you must love to hear. Do you know what that means about learning? It means be quiet when you're learning and listen and listen. Like we were joking today where he was like, I hear you. I hear you guys on the mic. So he says, but are you listening? Because you can hear us, but are you listening, right? I think I've gone over this before when we spoke about being a good listener, right? Which reminds me, what's up with that class about the fruits of the spirit? A brother asked me about that. He'd like that class up. Oh, that was one of the ones we didn't have audio for, right? I did that in two parts. I pray y'all took good notes because that class will never see the light of day. Uh, read that verse again. If thou love to hear, thou shalt receive understanding. And if thou bow thine ear, thou shalt be wise. So it says if you bow your ear, you shall be wise. Meaning in the process of learning, it's about listening. Not waiting to hear what you want to say. Uh, not there trying to ask a question that's really trying to show off that you know how to pair a precept. Right? Some brothers do that. Remember that the precept brothers. Does this precept with that? Could I say that this? And there's nothing wrong with those questions in sincerity. You know what? But you can ask those things after the class. They're not, it's not relevant to the class, right? Especially if I didn't bring that precept out. Why are you looking for another precept for that? Do that on your own study time, right? Say this. I'm not saying if you don't. It, sometimes y'all brothers say some insightful things, right? But learning means you listen. Let me get Proverbs 24 and 7. We're going to come back to Sirach. Proverbs 24 and 7. The book of Proverbs, chapter 24, verse 7. Wisdom is too high for a fool. See, if you're, if you're a fool, and what makes you a fool in your learning is all the things that we've spoken about the past few weeks, not listening, not applying what we're reading in Sirach right here. It says, wisdom's too high for a fool. Some of y'all some of y'all got a lot of knowledge, but wisdom y'all never be able to embrace. Right, because you lack that prudence to apply, to apply thy mind, to apply those studies, so that it, that knowledge can now uh, transform into what we know as wisdom. Right? Come on. He openeth not his mouth in the gate. Right. So it says, "Wisdom is too high for a fool." He openeth not his mouth in the gate. Uh, you know how the scripture talks about the gates of hell will not prevail. Meaning, that's the type of person that will never get to teach against the powers, the principalities. To speak against those things. He's not going to be able to open his mouth against those leaders and the rulers of wickedness in this earth. Because it's too high for you. So you don't want to be that fool, right? There's that other one uh, in Ecclesiastes 5 and 1. It says, be more ready to hear than give the sacrifice of fools. That goes with the sacrifice of fools is that you're waiting to say something. You must listen faithfully, prudently, apply, and let God give you the increase. Let God give you the increase. And, and I pray that y'all been, if you weren't, 
I pray that you've been adding that to your prayers to increase your knowledge, increase your understanding. I know a lot of times, especially when you do something pretty regularly, you go on autopilot with it. I've said this before, right? You brush your teeth, you're on autopilot, right? So a certain task, you just take a shower, you have a certain way you do it, right? I wash my hair first, then my face, then my body, then this, then I rinse this first. Without you realizing it. It's not even like a purposeful one. Some of you OCD people is purposeful, but that three pumps from the from the squirter, gotta be three. It's four, you gotta start all over, right? Some of you are laughing because you know you them people. Um, but when it comes to prayers, it should not be that way. This is why I said prepare thy mind, right? Get your thoughts right, get your mind right when you're gonna do your prayers. Yes, some things will be the same stuff you always ask for, right? But when you're doing your prayer where it's just you and it's the things you want to deal with. Your mind should be ahead of time prepared for the things you want to ask for, the things you want forgiveness for, all that stuff. All right? Let's go back to where we were in Sirach. Read verse 33 again. Sirach chapter 6, verse 33. If thou love to hear, thou shalt receive understanding. And if thou bow thine ear, thou shalt be wise. Right? So the willing spirit takes to, to learn takes action on your part. You're not just going to sit here and listen watch classes online, take a bunch of notes, and think that somehow you're going to get understanding. You know how many people do that? And they wind up back in the world in a worse state, right? There's more to learning than just watching, writing notes, right? And even answering Kahoot. There's more to it than that. Read on. Stand in the multitude of the elders. This is all part of the process of learning, right? And your elders, I know right away we think elders is contextual. Our, our most senior elder is the bishop, right? And then you have the ranking of the deacons, then you have the captain, so on and so forth. But even down, so if you're if you're a member, your elder is a soldier, even if he's 20 years younger than you, because he's an elder in this, because the Lord saw fit to raise him up, right? I, we don't do that because we're up here, uh, what do they call it? Uh, cronyism, where we're like, yeah, we like this brother, let's just put him up, right? There's tests, there's certain things, there's rankings that we're doing now to qualify these men and make sure that they're still maintaining the thing that got them the rank, right? Uh, if you're a visitor, in some essence, an elder to you is the brother that's been here longer than you. That's a member, right? So the circle is your opportunity for that. Right? That's a perfect example for me that I'll look at in that. But it's a stand in the multitude of the elders. It don't mean all of you are going to have access to come up to your local elders here and always be talking and chit-chatting with us about scriptures, right? It, there's, there's a flow, right? An ebb and flow to this whole thing. And it starts with that circle. That circle is one of the most critical things. We are talking uh, when Hannah and I was here last weekend and we were chit-chatting. We were talking about how um, some brothers, when they get demoted, they're not in the right spirit. They don't want to go back to the circle. One of the things when you're demoted is jump in that circle. Sit down there and go back, right? Because you have need that you get the, the basics again. And guess what? Even on demotion, you still retain some of that knowledge, right? So you're there and you're also a resource to some of these brothers being in that circle. This shows that willingness to learn. These are behaviors to do that. So when it says uh, stand in the multitude of the elders, come on. And cleave unto him that is wise. And it says cleave unto somebody that's wise. Like some of us up here informally have certain brothers that reach out to us more than others, right? Like, um, and it's not like it was anything ever set up. And it doesn't mean that they don't have the man over them that they go to for most things. But certain things, we've opened that door where they have a dialogue with us, right? So I have probably maybe one or two officers that, you know, they're always kind of reaching out to me here and there in the chats and stuff like that. I say we're best friends, but they're coming to me for things scripturally, right? Or advice in their life, right? Whatever it might be. And the most high orders that thing and sets it up a certain way. Come on, read on. Next verse. Be willing to hear every godly discourse. You know, that's so heavy because we always speak about how no scripture can come out enough. And then we don't really ever refer to a scripture for it. Be willing to hear every godly discourse. Means any time that it's the word of God, no matter how many times you might have heard it, no matter how basic it might be, you must, if you want to learn, if thou wilt be taught, you are willing to hear every godly discourse. As long as it's godly discourse. You sit down and you're willing. You have a willing spirit to hear it. You can't be like, well, I know that. 
Well, I'm working on this. I'm studying that. If it's godly, be willing to hear every godly discourse. Come on. And let not the parables of understanding escape thee. Don't, so it's letting you know that the parables, the way parables are written, if you don't have all these steps and this diligence in being uh, being able to be learned, to, to have the willing spirit to learn, the parables of understanding will escape you is what it's really saying, right? Because it says don't let them, but what it's letting you know that it's related to all these things we've spoken about. They will escape you. You might remember them for a season. You might remember them for a while. Or you'll just be confused as hell. And if you're confused about a parable, right, then you have to reassess these steps that we're speaking about, right? Come on, read them. And if thou seest a man of understanding, get thee betimes unto him, and let thy foot wear the steps of his door. Man, I love how some brothers try to use this, again, like I just spoke about, to jump the, to jump the horse, right? That's that term that they say you jump the horse means... You got the cart, you got the horse, you're trying to get in front of the the horse is supposed to what pull you forward. You trying to, you want to jump the horse. And, and and that's not the right order of things. And we had a brother here that was a soldier from another camp, came here, right? And uh moved five minutes away from me, right? <laughs> and was always trying to like throw that out there, like to see if he would get the invite to the house. I don't know this brother. My, the, the, the little portion that the Most High gave me on discerning spirits told me, be careful with this brother. And he always like reminded me that he five minutes ago, he said, hey, I want to weather the footsteps of your door. It don't work that way. You want to weather the captain uh, of 3,000 footsteps of his door, but not the soldier or the officer of 10 that's over you? That means you don't see the same respect. And if you can't respect the men that through the Spirit of the Most High in Christ, he showed us to, to select to be raised up. If you can't respect them, then it's all BS and it's lip service when you say that you want to respect us. Read this verse again. Verse 36. And if thou seest a man of understanding, get thee betimes unto him, and let thy foot wear the steps of his door. Plus, with the way uh, brothers and sisters be rolling, I don't need everybody. To, the, the footsteps on my door could be the table right here or a chair right here. I try to have all of y'all at my house. And when you get salty, you try to Come and vandalize my home or something like that. It's all right. I got cameras everywhere. Try it. <laughs> Go ahead, read. Let thy mind be upon the ordinances of the Lord. See, and that's one of the major things. It says for learning, your mind should be on the ordinances of the Lord. It's the law. He said, let your mind be on the law and thou wilt be taught. That's that willing spirit. If your emphasis is on your behavior and the behavior changes that we need to make, you're going to receive understanding. Read on. And meditate continually in his commandments. And he says you must meditate continually in his commandments. What that means is you're not sitting there, right, and you're, I don't know, say you're on the bus or on the train or whatever. You're, you're uh, sitting at work on your lunch break and you're just there and you're like reciting the Ten Commandments. I mean, fine, if you want to memorize them. But what it means is that in every interaction, in every part of your life, not just here in the congregation, you are making your decisions based on the commandments. That's what it means to meditate continually on the Lord. Right? Just like, just like we make our decisions on uh, clothing based on the color you like or a certain style you might like or whatever it is, that, that much, the same way you put that level of nuance into that, right? You go, you put on the shoes, right? You check in the mirror, you're looking at it, right? If you're into hats, you're throwing it on, right? Doing the different angles, all that stuff. Every decision that you make in your life, that's how it should be with the scripture. That's that looking glass that the scripture talks about. That's why it says when you walk away from that, right? You forget who you are. So you always need to reflect on that. So that's what it means to meditate continually. Come on. He shall establish thine heart and give thee wisdom at thine own desire. And then when he says he will establish your heart, he means that he will... Have that foundation laid in you to receive more understanding. He will have that foundation laid in your mind to give you what you need to learn, not what you want to learn. Because some of y'all come in here and you want to know the four horsemen, you want to know uh, uh, the ten virgins, you want to know the, the frogs and the vials and all this other stuff. But that's not what you need. And then when you have a man over you that the most high gives you what you need, y'all don't want to hear it. You say, I don't that, I don't want that to be my counselor. Bring it out. Because they tell me, they tell me uh, uh what I don't want to hear. 
And right now, I want to hear what I need. Well, we were talking about a brother in the officer meeting with the engineers, right? That they went to. A, okay, we're talking about somebody who was just saying, so we're, getting a, we're getting a report of the body, right? And when I say talking about not murmuring, right? Because there's a difference. Y'all talk about people and y'all ain't doing nothing. Y'all not their counselors. You ain't going to tell them anything to correct themselves. That's complaining and murmuring. That's gossiping and backbiting. We talk about people because we must know the state of the flock. So when I say we're talking about people, we're getting a report on certain men and certain issues in the body. And we talk about one brother, I think they was like, yeah, and then they went to this one, and then they went to that one. I said, you know they, why they kept going to different people for this advice? Because they had not heard yet what they wanted to do. They already made up their mind, but to try to make, that's that war in Galatians, which is the flesh and the spirit go against each other. They wanted to make it seem like I at least took steps to try to get counsel, but they didn't want to listen to the counsel. And the crazy thing was, is they had went through the chain, they got the, the counsel from the men over them, then they came to us and got counsel from us, and then even after that, they were still trying to seek counsel from other people. Because they were waiting for that one person that's going to be like, yeah, what you're saying? Yeah, do it. But up until that point, the Most High was telling them no. And then people get mad. They be like, the Most High don't show me things. He's showing you left and right everywhere through people on the earth to deal with you. And you just confused and woe is me. Because your mind is not established right. Read that last verse again. He shall establish thy heart. He shall establish thine heart and give thee wisdom at thy own desire. Right? But understand that there's actions that you got to take. When it says at thy own desire, it means application that you must do to get it. Not just because you're craving it. He's going to be like, boom, wisdom, here you go. Don't work that way. There's things we must do. Let's get Matthew 16 and 13. So wisdom don't come on your time. It comes on God's time. At his desire. And what he chooses to show you. St. Matthew chapter 16 verse 13. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea. Philippi. He asked his disciples saying. Whom do men say that I the son of man am? And they said. Some say that thou art John the Baptist. Some Elias. And others Jeremiah. Or one of the prophets. He saith unto them. But whom say ye that I am? Right, so everybody that, you see how so many people, their mind weren't established. They couldn't realize that he was the Messiah, right? That's why it's, that, that's a heavy point when you read these verses that you got to get. He says, there's some that are saying you're John the Baptist. John the Baptist was already known, and they're saying he's John. So it's going to show you that the same type of Israelites that you have now, like varied in understanding and ignorance and all that stuff, were there in Christ's times. Some were saying you're John the Baptist. Some say you're Elias. Others that you're Jeremiah, right? Or one of the other prophets. He said, but who do you say that I am? Right, Peter, come on. And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now stop. Before we read the next verse, the next verse is going to explain how, how he knew that. Christ is going to tell him how Peter was able to see that he was the Christ. And it wasn't that he studied his way to it. It wasn't that he uh, uh, just was so good in his scriptures that he knew the signs and he said it was that, right? This, this, this one verse here, I think, is the epitome of God gives the increase. Come on, read. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon bore Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee. It wasn't your, your thing to study. It wasn't that, you know, you're just a smart guy and you're so clever, Peter, that you figured it out. Come on. But my father, which is in heaven, God gave him the wisdom that that was the Christ. And all those other people that were saying he's John the Baptist or Elias or Jeremiah, they couldn't get it. Much like today that people cannot and they see that image. And not that the image is the, the true Christ. It's just a depiction, right? But how when you even tell them in absence of an image, because most of the time we ain't got that. And you just explain it to them in the scriptures what Christ looked like. They cannot receive it. Sometimes that's why you can't. You got to use the words of the scriptures, right? And some of us speak better than others, but you can't let that be a hang-up for you, right? And remember, um, when we spoke about Apollos, right? He was a learned man or whatever. He took that and was able to bring that into the subjection of the scriptures and became a mighty teacher. So much so that people were comparing him to Paul in his teaching, right? Because they were like, "I'm of Apollos, I'm of Paul," right? But it's not from fair words. It's not from any of that stuff. The point is, is that 
God is the one that's going to give them. So when we say there's no magic scripture, that's what we mean. There ain't no, but there ain't no scripture that's that's unturned or or haven't come out or that you got to receive it from somebody else. God opens up whether you receive that or not. And you have to believe that thing. And then if you believe that thing, you start to establish your mind in the right frame of mind of acknowledging how little your faith is. Start acknowledging what measure of uh, of the spirit is dished out unto you. And then if you're in the right spirit, you start working on increasing that thing by applying the stuff that we're reading in the scriptures. Read that whole verse 17 again. Verse 17. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon bore Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. God showed him that. Come on. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now here's funny. This is the one that Catholics use to build their whole doctrine. How many used to be Catholic? Raise your hand. I was a Catholic. Uh, uh, usually Northern Kingdom. I say Baptist or Pentecostal. I see a lot of Praise hey. <laughs> hey, Jesus. <laughs> Actually, I was all of them. I literally went through almost every denomination in my search for truth. I told you the story. I even went to the gay church at the end, right? Thinking that that was the answer. They didn't build themselves as a gay church, but there was a lot of homos around there, and it was in Chelsea. I should have told you something. It was in Chelsea. You don't know New York. Chelsea's like. Gay Central, all right? That in the, uh, the East Village. East Village. West Village is nice. Uh, so <laughs> that's what Catholicism uses to build their whole doctrine on, right? And remember, all Christianity is offshoots of Catholicism. Catholicism was the, was the, before there was a Pentecostal, before there was a Lutheran, a Baptist, right? A non-denominational, a seven-day Adventist, and whatever else, there was Catholicism. Right, it means universal, right? In every branch of that. So even though some of y'all are like you weren't Catholics, at some point in your life you were, right? Meaning not in this life, but in one of your lives, all right? Uh, so Catholicism, that's one of the tenets that they use to say the authority that they wield in the church. And they say Peter was the first pope based on that. That's, that's so if you don't know, now you know. That's where they get their doctrine from, right? So it says, and, uh, and thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So now, Isaiah 28 and 16. We're going to deal a little bit with Christ being the rock. And this is all necessary before we get to the parable, so that then you can understand the parable. And go, and, and, and see, this is how it works with parables. You have to have some understanding of the rest of the scriptures in order to understand the parable. And that's why... When they ask Christ, why do you speak in parables? He goes, because unto you, it is to understand the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. It's This is why it's sealed that way. This is why Peter says people struggle with Paul's writings as they do with the rest of the scripture. Because you must have a strong foundation in your understanding in order to understand other parts of the Bible. It's some of you, when it comes to matters of counsel, can't understand a scripture and don't receive it. It's because your foundation is lacking. Right? And your foundation starts with Christ. So let's get Isaiah 28 and 16. The book of Isaiah, chapter 28, verse 16. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation of stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. And this is speaking about Christ. He said, I lay in Zion this stone. Not for all nations. Again, such a simple Verse as far as that one line. And if you understood that, then you would not have Catholicism when they said this rock. Because he said, I and we're going to give you more scriptures. He said, I lay in Zion. Christ. Christ was for Zion. Remember, in all the nations of the earth, it will be blessed. And I said, Where's the precept for that? What was they get it last time? Abraham and all the nations of the earth, thou shalt be blessed. What is the blessing? What is the precept? Uh, let me try Elkanah. So Elia got it wrong last time. Let's see if you remember it now. And well, it was a Kahoot question. Come on, read a shit. Let's start. Acts 3 and 26. Yes. 25. Acts 3 25, right? Yes. So he's saying Christ was big. This is what this is saying when he says, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone. But he's saying it in a similitude here. But he was talking about Christ. 
that Christ is for Israel only. All right? Let me get 1 Corinthians 3 and 10. Yeah, 3 and 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. So you have to understand that verse in Isaiah to then begin to understand all the other scriptures in the New Testament that talk about the foundation and the rock. Talk about the foundation and the rock. So really, when you read verse 10 here, that foundation literally is Christ. Is Christ. And I know when we when we did the class recently, I used these scriptures when we were talking about uh, God giving the increase and everything. But I didn't want to get into the uh, uh, the similitude of it representing Christ yet because it would I think it would have taken away from the essence of what we were bringing out in that class. But the foundation is Christ, because what did Paul teach? Christ. Because Paul was teaching just the law, just the sacrificial law prior to that. He was even killing Israelites that were professing Christ. But now he says, he says, I am a wise master builder. But when we get towards the end of the class, we're going to come back to the wise part, why he was wise with it. He says, lay the foundation and another builder thereon, but let every man take heed how he buildeth upon that foundation. So. When we lay a foundation, not only are we laying it for the nation, each and every one of us, you're laying it for each individual brother and sister that you bring that basic understanding in Christ to. So, for example, when you go to somebody and you show them, let's say all you know is Deuteronomy 28, and you give them Deuteronomy 28, 15 through 68, you've started to lay a foundation for that person. Because a lot of times, I think oftentimes we think that if you're not a teacher in the streets, right, like if you're not out there doing flyers or doing a Titus chat or whatever, each and every one of you, every time you share the gospel of Christ, are laying a bit of that foundation. And you have to realize that it stems from that, and it's not from you, and it's not anything else, right? Come on, read. For other foundation can no man lay, then that is laid, which is Jesus Christ, right? So he's telling you there plainly, because there is no other foundation you can lay. It's not your own. It's Jesus Christ is that foundation. Come on, read. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Right, so he's letting you know a foundation is given to you. So for example... That kind of goes with Mark 4, where it says, some hear the word, right? And because, and really, instead of foundation, what it's telling you there is saying the soil, right? And it says, some are on rocky ground. So that's an unstable foundation. Some are on, uh, uh, some don't get planted at all. There was no foundation. So the foundation starts, brothers and sisters, from when you initially give that initial understanding. The minute you reveal to somebody that they're an Israelite and what's required of them, a foundation has been laid. And then at that point, right, depending on the situation, if you're somebody here, you continue to get cultivated, right, by the various teachers and the levels of leadership that we have, by the weekly classes, by being a part of IUIC and getting your learning from all the different leaders, right, all the watering that happens, right? Well, what if it's not? And it's somebody who received the word and then they go away, right, and they forget for a week or two weeks or whatever it might be. A foundation was still laid upon them, and then it's up to them to build on it. And that building is twofold. In the last, last, I don't know, it was last week or the week before when I went over this, I was talking about um, the work being the multiplication of the people, right? And how we do it that way. But it also, right, because if the church of God starts with you in your own house, it means your works and stuff as well, right? So all foundations are tried by the fire. Come on, verse 14. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. And if your work abide, meaning if it endures until the end, whether you die in this life or Christ returns in this life, it says you will receive a reward for that behavior. The reward if the work survives the fire. If the work survives the fire. Let's get Ephesians 2 and 6.
the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verse 16. And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you, which were afar off. So he says and that he might reconcile both unto God. So he's talking about Christ here. In one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. Enmity is like a deep hate, right? So basically what he's saying, he's slain that enmity. This is a couple things being said here. Talk about the enmity between Southern Kingdom and Northern Kingdom. And also the enmity that Christ had, I'm um, sorry, that the Most High had for us. Jeremiah 17, 4, we're going to come right back to that. Remember, I've been bringing out that grace is the ability to reconcile with God. That's really what the grace is, right? He thinks the grace is the liberty to sin. Grace is the ability to reconcile with God. And how do you reconcile with God? By keeping his commandments. And now, after being that Christ was crucified, in the faith of his son, Jesus Christ. Come on. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 4. And thou, even thyself, shalt discontinue from thine heritage that I gave thee. Right? Because there's a split. There's a divide. You've discontinued. Come on. And I will cause thee to serve thine enemies in the land which thou knowest not. For ye have kindled a fire in mine anger, which shall burn forever. Right? Ye have kindled a fire in my anger that shall burn forever. Go back. Ephesians 2 and 16. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 16. And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross. Right? That reconciliation. Reconcile the two kingdoms together. Reconcile us back to God. Come on. Having slain the enmity thereby. So the enmity was slain by the sacrifice of his son. That, that indignation that he would have for us. Come on. And came and preached peace to you which were afar off. And to them that were not. Right. So and preach peace to you. Them that were far off and them that were nigh. Meaning those of us that were strangers without the covenants. Without the law, statutes, and commandments. Come on. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. So through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. So those that were keeping the commandments always and those that happened to go astray. That's the same thing like in uh, Romans 11 when he says the wild olive tree being grafted back in. That's the reconciliation. Come on. Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. And again, if you understand what we just read, remember, I lay in Zion, a chief cornerstone, that blessing in Acts 3, everything that we read up until this point. If you understand that, then you understand here that he's not saying that strangers can come back. Because to reconcile means come back again, right? You've ever heard that? Oh, let, let's reconcile. Like a husband and wife, they've reconciled. They're back together. They reconciled. I mean, so for something to be reconciled, is my point, means that there has to have been a relationship prior to it. So you cannot take reconciliation and apply that to all nations because they never had a relationship with God. So now it all starts to make more sense as you continue to read this stuff. Because trust me, I get it. Even some of you have been here three, four, five years, it can be challenging to explain some of the more nuanced verses to people. You can always go to uh, things like Matthew 5, 17, uh, where he says the law is not done away with. You can always go to, uh, um, is it in uh, John, where he says salvation is of the Jews? I can't remember exactly where it is. Um, Right, so you can, you can always go to things like that and that'll kind of help you for somebody that don't know their scriptures, but then somebody starts coming out and they start talking to you about this stuff, it's gonna be hard for you to articulate it and defend it. But it's not so hard when you have your foundation right. Because remember what I said before, there's a lot of things that many of us may understand, myself included, but not many of us can actually explain it to people who don't understand. And, and you, you would think that that sounds counterintuitive, but it's kind of like the person that, um, to give you an example of a handyman, he could be great, right, as a handyman, but he doesn't have the ability to show anybody else how to do it because he knows how to do it. He knows how to uh, do carpentry and everything else, but it's just in here, right? He can't show somebody else. Or drawing, right? That's another hard one to teach, right? Like if you, especially if you ain't got no type of drawing skill, like I'm terrible, stick figures all day, and even those are horrible, but, right? But not everybody who has that can show somebody else, right? So it's not so far-fetched then to say that you can understand something and not be able to articulate it to somebody else, right? There's a difference. Not all that have that 
spiritual gift of being a teacher to show somebody things. And that takes that takes a, a gift from the Lord to be able to show somebody that stuff. But at a basic level, you have to be able to articulate it to some degree. Uh, did we get on verse 20? <laughs> verse 20. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. And he's letting you know that through all this, right, that reconciliation and all that stuff, he says is built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ being the chief cornerstone. I'll explain the part about the apostles and prophets again when we get towards the end of the class, when he says the foundation of the apostles and prophets. It's not a contradiction to what we read prior where he spoke about um, no foundation other than the foundation of Christ, okay? Uh, I'll explain that later. Right now, I just want to focus that. He says Jesus Christ himself is the chief cornerstone. So in this, you have to have some understanding of like uh, masonry. I'm not talking about Masonic 33rd level BS. I'm talking about actual masonry where you build stuff. And there's a chief cornerstone, right? And when you look up the chief corner, I probably should have had him look it up. The chief cornerstone is basically... Um, that's the strongest point of the foundation. And uh, you have to have that there. And, and upon that rest, the whole rest of the foundation. And then you build upon that. And if the chief cornerstone is not set correctly, the whole the whole building is no good. Right? It, it can fall apart. Um, so let me get Galatians 2 and 10. The book of Galatians, chapter 2, verse 10. Only they would that we should remember the poor, the same which I also was forward to do. Why poor? When, when he says poor, what is he talking about? He says we should remember the poor. Should we remember the people, the homeless people that are out there when you go to the intersections? The signs trying to get money from you? Uh, okay, I'll take that. I'll take that. That's good. That's good. Our heritage, right? Remember Paul's time here, right? With, and our heritage is the law, statutes, and commandments. But heritage is more encompassing because it deals with the promise of Christ just being for us, right? So that's why I, I, I like heritage more. And then you explain that laws is part of the heritage. That is our heritage. That is our custom. Um, it's important to understand that because, again, it goes back with that. Say someone was poor. Why were you poor? Because that means you were without something. You're not, you're not sufficient. Right? And I like not sufficient because remember, some of us, remember John 4, knew that we were Israelites. We just weren't keeping commandments worth the day. Right? So, right, just like when you're poor, you might be able to pay your rent, but you're only able to eat like rice and bologna. Right? So, you know, insufficient. So it's the same type of thing, but spiritually. Okay, so that's the poor. Come on, read on. Verse 11. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I would stood him to the face because he was to be blamed. For before that servant came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them that which were of the circumcision. Now, I was going to ask about this, but I'll, I'll just, for the sake of time, explain it real quick. Basically, Peter understood that the Gentiles were able to be received back in. And when I say Gentiles, I'm talking about the Israelites, right? Uh, like Such as the sister by the well in John 4. And when the other brothers came, right, when the other Jews came that were opposed to that, right, he would not eat with them. So basically he would break bread knowing what God said, that they could be brought back in. But because he was so worried about what others would think that they didn't have the understanding yet, when they were around, he would shun them, right? So it's kind of like uh, when, when you were in high school and you had, like, the nerdy friend and, like, you're actually pretty cool with them and you like them a lot, but your popular friends would be like, hey, what are you doing hanging out with that person, right? That sort of thing. That's the kind of behavior that was going on there. Come on, read. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him. And because of his actions now, because Peter was of note, the other Jews dissembled with him. It's a dissemble means that they start to create that variance with him, right? They started to kind of buy into that stuff. Kind of like Peter's actions instigated the rest of them to not receive that that enmity was supposed to be gone. Come on. And so much that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. Right, because Barnabas knew also. So he's saying, hey, in so much that Barnabas was also carried away with that, right? I think, because uh, remember, Barnabas was part of the thing where they had the strong disputation, I think, in Acts. So he's letting you know, 
Barnabas supposedly had already got over that. But Peter's actions brought that spirit back out in Barnabas, right? Go ahead, read verse 14. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all. So notice what he said here. They didn't walk uprightly according to the truth of the gospel. So those people out there that don't want to accept Northern Kingdom, you no matter how much you're doing in this walk, you're not a, a walking uprightly in the truth of the gospel. You're, you're, you're not going to make it. You better, you better get some, with all that getting, get understanding, right? Like the scripture says, because you ain't going to make it if you don't embrace that. Don't just try to play at it. You need to understand it and believe it. And God's the one that's going to give you that belief. So you're, you're, you're kicking against the pricks otherwise. Go ahead. Come on. I said unto Peter before them all, if thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles, and not as do the Gentiles, why compels thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? Right. So this was going into, and we'll explain it as we go further on, the sacrificial stuff, right? Meaning more like the traditions, right? And not preaching Christ as the foundation versus just the law, right? We've gone over this a lot recently with what, what that really means when it says that. I know the easy answer is to say animal sacrifice is done away with, but you have to understand what the animal sacrifice represented and why it's done away with, right? At certain stages in your walk, it's enough for you to know that animal sacrifice was done away with. That's what it's talking about. But you that's you have to get to a point where you understand what the animal sacrifice represented to begin with, and that's why it was done away with, right? Which I did the prior classes. The audio is good on those classes. Okay, okay. So, so he's saying here, he's like, listen, if you're gonna roll and ride like them, right? So he says, if you live after the matter of Gentiles and not as the Jews, why do you compel the Gentiles to live as the Jews also? Because that was the issue that the Jews had. Remember in Acts 15 where he, they were saying. Don't put more things on them than they can bear. They got Moses to take their time to learn that. Only focus on the most urgent things for them to change. That's what he's talking about, right? Come on. Read. We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles. So what does that mean? It says we that are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles. That's a heavy verse right there. Right? One sentence. What does that mean? In the context of everything... We're bringing out yeah. the, the judgment for those sins, the punishment for those sins. So when you see the word justified in the New Testament, it's that with Christ's sacrifice, the judgment for those sins were done. Under the old law, you killed the turtle dove, the judgment still remained until you killed another turtle dove if you committed that sin again. It's the, that's what was crucified with Christ. As I said, if I change the question, you guys will get it. But that's too easy. You got to be able to read this stuff in the scripture yourself. Because this is another one that they'll pull. See, the Lord doesn't justify. So read verse 16 again. Verse 16. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law. They'll take that and say, see, don't keep the commandments. Come on. But by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ. That we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. So all of y'all gave right answers in regards to that last part. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. But everything else y'all didn't articulate it clearly enough. Come on, read on. But if, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. And this is how you can trip them up. Have them explain verse 17 to you then, right? If they say 16 is that you don't keep the laws. I've told you this before. Don't be that. You have to let them articulate their point because they can't. They can't. I'm telling you they cannot. There is not. More things are shown unto you than men understand. They cannot ever articulate their point. Not if you have them go into stuff. So we say, but if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we are so are also found sinners, meaning you want you don't want the judgment for the sins that were crucified with Christ, but then you want to run around continuing to sin, which is what Christianity says. He died for your sins, right? Catholicism chiefly. He died for your sins. He saying, but if your sons are found sinners, then is Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. They are making Christ the minister of sin. They're saying he died so you can sin. To minister, what's a minister? A help. They're saying Christ is to help you sin. That's evil as hell. So he's telling you, God forbid, 
You're not supposed to be found sinners just because the judgment for those sins was crucified. Come on. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. Right? Again, so if I build the things again I destroy, the old man, the works of the flesh, he said, then I make myself a transgressor. What do you transgress against? Sin is the transgression of the law. You got to pick up the words in the Bible. Transgressor, sin is the transgression of the law. Come on. For I threw the law and dead to the law. That I might live unto God. That's why I say you got to understand the past few weeks of classes that I brought out. He says, for I threw the law and dead to the law that I might live unto God. Meaning I don't have to give an animal sacrifice anymore, right? So he says, for I threw the law and dead to the law that I might live unto God. Now you don't live to kill the next animal. You live to get eternal life, right? And reconcile with the Father. Come on. I am crucified with Christ. The Never, old man is dead with Christ. Come on. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Why? Because you remember how it says, uh, the unclean spirit goes away if you leave it clean and swept and comes back? You must replace that with the spirit of Christ. You furnish that with the foundation of Christ. Come on. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Right, they just love that part, though. He loved himself for me with no understanding on the rest of it. Come on, verse 21. I do not frustrate the grace of God. Anything else. Christianity's message, their doctrine is frustrating the grace of God. They try to claim that we frustrate the grace of God. That we are modern day Pharisees in teaching these commandments. But Paul just explained to you here in Galatians, no, when you preach this other stuff, you frustrate the grace of God. Remember, I'm bringing it up to today. But when we get into the parable, you have to understand what was going on at the time and what was what was meant there. I don't want to give it away yet, all right? So he says, I do not frustrate the grace of God. Come on. For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. So the point is, that's what the faith of Christ really means. And so it's not the law alone. You can't just keep the law and not understand. So even more so for your own salvation, you have to get this understanding. Because if you don't understand that Christ died in vain, it's not just the law, brothers and sisters. It's the faith of Christ and understanding what that faith in Christ really represents and what does it mean. And from the day of atonement to today, every class that I've gone over is trying to help you understand that in different ways. All right? Covering different areas of the New Testament for y'all to get that. Uh, let me get John 14 and 6. The book of St. John, chapter 14, verse 6. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. What does that mean? What does that say? Well, that's good. You got the last part because nobody was getting the last part, right? Christ has to reveal it to you that Christ is the mediator, which is the way, the truth, the life. Right. I, I gave a, a whole class on it, isn't it? I think it's up, right? I gave a whole class on the way to truth the life. So if you don't know, and a lot of y'all struggling with that, you need to go back and watch that class. But I want quick cuts that you can use to explain that to somebody. I'm going to give it to you because it's going to take too long. None of none, that precept's not going to help you. None of what you say is going to help you with a Christian that's there trying to talk to you about that. You, it's not the laws; it's only through Christ. Remember, that's the crux of everything, right? They're going to tell you it's not the laws. Uh, let's start with uh, life. Give me John 6, 63. Quick, quick ones, right? The class that I did, I went in much more detail. John 6, 63, quick ones that you can use on the street. It says he's the life. Well, what does that mean? St. John chapter 6, verse 63. It is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profited nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirits. And they are life. They are spirit and they are life. The words that I speak unto you. And then from there, you can go into, uh, depending on how versed you are, you can go to Matthew 5, 17. Right? Not one jot, not one tittle. So he's speaking to you the law. You can go into John, uh, is it 14, 15 and 15, 14. Right? About uh, keeping my commandments. You're my friends. All right? If you do uh, uh, my father's will. All that stuff. Um so the life, real quick, John 6, 63 is the life. Now, uh, read verse 44. Verse 44. No man can come to me except the Father which hath 
sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. So another quick way to explain that last part where he says he can't come to me except of the Father. He says no man can come to him except the Father which hath sent me. God has to call you to Christ. You don't choose him. God calls you to Christ. Let me get Acts 9 and 1. The book of Acts chapter 9 and verse 1. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus to the synagogues, that he, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And so simply, a real simple way to say the way is anybody that's following after what Christ was teaching. Because Saul said he desired, it says that here, uh, he had threatenings and slaughters against the disciples of the Lord, right? Meaning students of Christ. And desired him, led us to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, meaning that you were a student of Christ, right? Following after Christ, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. See, we've yet suffered a time. We man, I've been thinking about you the other day when you talk about the trials and tribulations. Everybody's suffering. You think that because woe is me. Uh, I lost my job. I can't afford the finer cuts of meat. Uh, the, they didn't give me a raise. Whatever it is, all the little things that you think are trials and tribulations, you got arrested, man or woman, and you were bound, dragged to Jerusalem and you were found worshiping Christ. That's not happening to us yet. Yet. Because for, for y'all don't realize what you in. And at one point, I know it's unfathomable to believe that at some point that will happen. This is America. You can profess what you want. Not if it's according to this. You can, you can, you can, you can be born in every way, the most, the way the most high made you, man or woman, and then say you're not either of those. And that's what America allows you to teach. You can look just like the imposters that stole our heritage and say that they them, and that's what this country allows you to preach. But Lord forbid you bring out the truth. So they were they were doing this upon pain of death. It says threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord. So the way is the following after Christ. Isaiah 30 and 20. Another scripture for the way. The book of Isaiah, chapter 30 and verse 20. And though the Lord give you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, yet shall not thy teachers be removed into a corner anymore, but thine eyes shall see thy teachers. Right? So he says the bread of adversity and captivity, the tears that will flow on our eyes because of all the atrocities done to us in slavery and so on. Come on. And thine ears shall hear a word behind thee saying, this is the way. Walk ye in it, when ye turn to the right hand, and when ye turn to the left. So the way is not just Christ the mediator. When it says you hear a word behind you and say, this is the way, that's what we do when we're out there teaching. And they're walking by, or they're driving by, or whatever it might be. This is the way. Walk ye in it. Brother, you ain't right. You got to grow your beard and wear fringes. Sisters, you got to come out of your pants. By the mere fact of that correction, you're teaching them identity. And correction, that's the way. That's the way. That's what it means. This is the way. So y'all were right in your answers, each and every one of you. But somebody who don't know, I ain't going to understand you. So some of y'all think you're so clever in your own minds, but you can't teach anybody else anything. What profit is it then that you have? Well, you don't labor for yourself only. But for those who, who desire and need understanding. This is why we started off in uh, 1 Corinthians 3 and, was it 10? No, not 10. Uh, where were we early? When he said, uh, think of the poor always, right? No, it wasn't Matthew. Which one was that? That's what it was, Galatians 2 and 10. He said, think of the poor always. So in your learnings, you're not just here for yourself. Think of the poor always. The poor in spirit that do not have sufficient, that they walk on in the, in the darkness that we once did. And be able to bring yourself to a space where you can articulate that. You have to be able to get yourself to that place. Let me get Acts 4 and 10. The 
the book of Acts, chapter 4, verse 10. Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him that this man stand before you whole. Come on. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which is become the head of the corner. Right? So ye builders here, who are the builders? It says you were set at naught, the builders. Jehoiakim. And I saw you as you, but not it's it's not yet. That's not the builders this is talking about. These builders were the uh, scribes and Pharisees. Right. The scribes and Pharisees. And why do you say that? Because it says at not. Right. There you go. Because he says you set him at naught. Right? You set him at naught. Read that verse again. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Hey, you heard that? There's no other name which we've been given other than Jesus Christ, which you read up there, which we will be saved. There is no other. Some of you brothers is on that name doctrine on the low. Some of you don't know. And they're not going to be saying that. But, but when I say name doctrine, I mean saying that you have to say the name. And you have to have the name. The scriptures tells you the name that we got now. Under heaven is Jesus Christ. Voice. That's it. That's the name. There's no other name under heaven but that name. Let me get Matthew 21 and 33. St. Matthew chapter 21, verse 33. Okay. Here were another parable. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard and hedged it round the belt and digged a winepress in it and built a tower and let it out to husbandmen. And went into a far country. Right, come on. And when the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandmen, that they might receive the fruits of it. And the husbandmen took his servants and beat one, and killed another, and stoned another. Right. So, it says here another parable. So let's break this down little by little. Who is the householder? Nope. Calling out answers. Yeah, okay. Strong and wrong, though. It's a cruise. So if your answer was Christ, put your hand down. See, he, he took it out already. It's, it's the Father. Right. It's the Most High. It's God. It's the Father. That's the householder. All right. So he says, here another parable. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard. What is the vineyard? I'm going to show you the scriptures for it. Slowly. Israel. Israel. Israel is the vineyard. So let's, let's start with Isaiah 5 and 1. So what is Isaiah 5 and 1? I'll give you a few for the vineyard. The book of Isaiah, chapter 5, verse 1. Now will I sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My well-beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. Come on. And he fenced it and gathered out the stones thereof and planted it with the choicest vine and built a tower in the midst of it and also made a winepress therein. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes. And it brought forth wild grapes. Now, some Bibles have a thing here. The parable of the vineyard overlaps with the parable of the husbandman, which we're reading. Some of the words here you read there, which is yet another way to show you that Christ quoted the Old Testament all the time. All the time. Not just Paul. Christ too. Dummies out there talking about no Old Testament. They out of their damn mind. Christ was teaching the Old Testament. He was just. Doing it on a level that nobody in the earth ever did, right? Jump to verse 7. And you can read, it's actually good to read the whole thing, but the point is verse 7. Verse 7. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. There it is, nice and plain. That's the vineyard. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, right? Come on. And the men of Judah, his pleasant plants. Right, because Judah, a scepter shall not depart from him. Judah is above him, right? Come on. And he looked for judgment, and behold, oppression, for righteousness, but behold, a cry. So remember those verses as we went there, right? 
So when he says, uh, let's go back now to uh, Matthew. Read uh, 21, 33 again. Verse 33. Here another parable. There was a certain house owner which planted a vineyard and hedged it round about and digged a wine press in it and built a tower and let it out to husbandmen and went into a far country. And the tower is meaning the temple, right? Or the synagogue, the place where they were going to go get that knowledge, right? Because the tower is there to stand out amongst things, right? To stand out amongst the vineyard. And if the husbandmen, like we brought out, are the Pharisees, which they are, and that's where they were, right? So the householder is God, the vineyard is Israel, the tower is the temple, and the husbandman is the Pharisees. And what he's saying is here, he said, uh, he let it out to husbandmen. It's his vineyard, but meaning he put stewards over it. It's husbandmen. Remember, when we speak of husbandry, it's talking about farming. So he let it out to husbandmen, meaning they were supposed to cultivate and maintain the land. He gave them, when you read in Isaiah in 5 and 2, he talks about uh, 1 and 2. He talks about how he, he put a precious stone around it. He put a hedge around it, right? And, and he made it plentiful, right? Because Israel, top people, best people in the world. Say here, you're gonna be the caretakers of my vineyard. That's the, the level of responsibilities the Pharisees had. And then as you read on, he says, uh, and when the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandmen that they might receive the fruits of. So meaning he put the spirit on people, because right, we are his servants, to go and learn. And he says, and when they drew near, they went so that they could might receive the fruits. And he says, the husbandmen took the servants and beat one and killed another and stoned another. What is that talking about? We just read it. We didn't just read it. We read a few verses. Uh, in, in Acts, like for the example that, that Paul was slain yes. or Saul was slain. Yes. Anybody Acts that 9, died. 1 and 2, right? So it's literally talking about that. So he says, this vineyard is real, but Christ is saying it in a parable. But he's really basically getting on the Pharisees, on the Pharisees here, right? Um, so let me get uh, Acts 7 and 51. The book of Acts, chapter 7 and verse 51. This will help explain what we're speaking about here. Ye stiff necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do ye. Right, that resistance of the Holy Ghost was basically the calling that they were given as well, right? Uh, remember how Christ tells them uh, you sh they were so focused on the ceremonial stuff, and he says, I'm paraphrasing it, you should have not. You should have done one and not forget the other. Meaning, still do that other stuff, but you didn't do the things about mercy and stuff. Right? I can't remember exactly where it is. We brought it out not too long ago. Uh, not in this class, in another class. Right? So he says, you do always resist the Holy Ghost. Come on. As your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And when he says, as your fathers did, so do ye, that's because the same wicked generation, right, is, is here. It was there and it's here today. Come on. Which of the prophets have your fathers have not your fathers persecuted? Right. So you were correct in saying the prophets, um, Jehoiakim. Right. You said prophets. Right. It was, but I wanted the specific example of what was being done. Right. Come on. And they have slain them, which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers. The just one is Christ. Right. So he says, and they have slain them, which showed before of the coming of the just one. Anybody that was teaching that, like what we read in Acts 9, 1 and 2, we said this is the way, right? That's like uh, the Mandalorian. Where do you think they get that from? You know, if you watch that show on Disney, it says this is the way. This is the way, right? So, right, all that's missing is walk ye in it. This is the way, walk ye in it. That's where they get it. I'm telling you, they, at all Hollywood, they just take snatch stuff from the Bible. Y'all be thinking we, we, we bugged out. Nah, they just think everything's about the Bible. Everything is about the Bible. Yeah, that's right. To date, it is still the number one selling book of all time. Come on, read. Who have received the law by the dispensation of angels and have not kept it. Right, so it's not talking about angels in the sun. Again, it's going into those prophets, those leaders, right? Those that are followers of Christ, that, that, that are preaching and saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. So he says, so they've received the law by the dispensation of the angels and have not kept it. Read on. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. And they gnashed on him with their teeth. So this is giving you a little more detail to what we read in verse 35, where it says they stoned them and all that, right? Come on. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God 
and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord. You know what that's like? You ever see a kid throw a fig and they cover their ears? He was giving them that's that. So it wasn't that they were just resisting. They were like, yeah, I don't want to keep that because I want to keep sinning. They were like, be quiet. Don't tell us that. Right? And it says it vexed them so much that they ran upon him with one accord, meaning their intent was murderous instantly. Come on. And cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet. Whose name was Saul. Right, so that's all I wanted on that. Now go back, read verse uh, 35 in Matthew. I'm sorry, 21 35. St. Matthew chapter 21 and verse 35. And the husbandman took his servants and beat one and killed another and stoned another. So I just gave you an example of how that went down, right? We gave a whole illustration of how that happened. Come on. Again, he sent other servants more than the first. And they did unto them likewise. Right. So when he says again, I said other servants more than the first, and they did unto them likewise. I'm going to explain that in a second. Come on. But last of all, he sent unto them his son, saying, they will reverence my son. Right. So throughout our history, he sent prophets, he sent teachers. At the end, he sent Pharisees, and they all treated it the same way. They did not respect the vineyard of the Lord. Right. They were persecuting anybody that was not going into their traditions and their customs. They had that above all. Remember, I was paraphrasing where Christ was telling them, you should have had mercy and not neglect the other as well. Right? So, And then he says, at the end, he said, listen, the householder said, I'm going to send my son, saying they will reverence my son. That also lets you know that the household is not Christ in verse 33, because he says, I sent my son in verse 37. Right? Come on, read. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the hot this this is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and let us seize on his inheritance. The Pharisees' hatred for Christ is what this is speaking about. So it says they said, Hey, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and let us seize on his inheritance. They knew that he was the Messiah. It wasn't of some feigned thing that they were saying that he was a false prophet. They knew, but their spirits could not receive him. Remember how we say you can only receive that I'm the way, the truth, the life of the Father? Because up until that point, that, that was that was be, that's a perfect example of being given over to a reprobate mind. They knew that he was the Messiah, but they still had hatred for him and couldn't reverence him like they were supposed to. Knowing and understanding everything that was in store for them. Like, how do you know it and still go against it, right? That's the reprobate mind. That they were given over to. Let me get John 11 and 47 because it says, uh, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and let us seize on his inheritance. St. John chapter 11, verse 47. Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees in council and said, What do we? For this man doeth many miracles. If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him, and the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. You see, this is why he's this is why Christ was saying. They said, this is the heir, and he will take this from us. Whereas they should have been good stewards, they wanted to become the Lord over us. And there's a difference. A steward is a caretaker until the time of the king comes back. And when the king came, they did not want to give up their rulership. They said, he's going to take away our place and our nation. Hey, and it's the same like today. A lot of these uh, pastors out there, they don't want to be supplanted by us and what we're teaching. Let me get John 5 and 43. The book of St. John, chapter 5, verse 43. I am come in my Father's name, and ye receive me not. If another come in his own name, him ye will receive. How can ye believe which receive honor one of another, and seek not the honor that cometh from God so, only? So he's saying you guys are accustomed to receiving honor one of another. So how can you not believe when I come in the Father's name? Remember what we read, the parable said, he said, I'm not, listen, they, they, they destroyed all my prophets. They always resisted the Holy Ghost, right? Who were talking about the just one. Now, nah, my son, they're going to receive my son. Letting you know that those, those perverse spirits which are here today, it, you, Jesus Christ 
to come again like he did here and say, hey, hi, everybody, I'm Christ. We know he's not coming like that. Next time he's going to fly. But he come and do that, and they still will not believe. Not everyone can receive. You have to be received of him by the Father. The Father will let you see that he is the Christ, that that is the way, that he is the light. Come on, read on. Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. He said, listen, I don't need, I, by your actions, don't think that I have to accuse you to the Father, right? By what you did to me, that's going to be accusation to the Father. Come on. There was one that accused you, even Moses, in whom he trusts. Right? So he's letting you know that the law will, this is why, again, I go back to that point where he says you should have done one and still do the other, not forget the other, right? And he's going to expound upon that now. He goes, because Moses accuses you in whom he trusts. Come on. For had he believed Moses, he would have believed me, for he wrote of me. That's that veil that we went over last week that's talking about, remember earlier when I said, you have to understand, yes, it's good enough to a point to say animal sacrifice was done away with, but you must understand and be able to articulate what animal sacrifice represented in simple terms in order to be able to share that with the people. So he says, if he believed Moses, you would have believed the me, for he wrote of me. And no, it's not just when he said, uh, someone will come like unto you. Whenever he was talking about all those different things about the sacrifice and remember when we went over the scapegoat and all that other stuff, that was all under Moses that was brought out. And that was all symbolic of Christ. And it was only given to a certain number to see that. Come on. But if ye believe not his writings, how shall you believe my words? So letting you know, hey, if you, don't, if you don't believe the Old Testament, if you can't believe the stuff that Moses was writing, then you ain't going to believe my words either. So what that's really telling you is that you were never rooted. You were never in the midst of the proper understanding in the scriptures, right? Moses will accuse them to the Father. Let me get Romans 16 and 17. The book of Romans, chapter 16 and verse 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, Mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good works and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. So now, I know we use this scripture a lot to bring it up to today, but you have to understand this goes with what we were reading with the husbandmen. The, 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 the doctrine contrary to the scriptures was... The doctrine of Christ, that being the way, right? Remember, Acts 9, 1 and 2. He says, anyone of this way, bring bound, because they're not teaching, uh, basically, reference to the Pharisees. They're, they're teaching Christ and that he's here and the Messiah died and is risen, right? But it says, listen, you're supposed to mark them, right, that cause those divisions, and those are offenses contrary to the doctrine, right? Let me get Psalms 111 and 10. The book of Psalms, chapter 111 and verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all they that do his commandments. Right, so going back to being able to understand this, uh, the writings of Moses, the message in Christ, it says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of that, the application of that stuff. What it's telling you is that for the Pharisees to have said what they said in uh, when we read John 11, right? Let's you know that they really did not fear the Lord. This is why they did not have that proper understanding. Let's get to Rock 21 and 11. They didn't fear God. The book of Sirach, chapter 21, and verse 11. He that keepeth the law of the Lord getteth the understanding thereof. Right, so again, uh, a lot of times I ask for precepts for Psalms 111 and 10, right? We speak about how for us that's the deepest precept in the Bible, right? As far as getting yourself set up. Here in Sirach, he says it in a different way. If you keep the law of the Lord, you get the understanding thereof. Come on. And the perfection of the fear of the Lord is wisdom. And perfecting that fear of the Lord is wisdom, right? Remember, I said knowledge is knowing the stuff, wisdom, right? We started off with application. So he's letting you know that if you keep the law, you get the understanding of. We just read in Psalms 111 and 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of that understanding. And here he says the perfection of the fear of the Lord is wisdom. So the more application you have in that, the more you'll be able to see these levels of understanding. 
I went over a class on the Pharisees and the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. I'm showing you all the different things that they weren't keeping themselves, right? But expecting everybody else. They basically trimmed it down to a position of authority and, and reverence. And that's all they wanted from it. They got corrupted by that whole thing. And that's why they, they blew up the Messiah. Uh, and, they, and they handed him over to the heathen. Matthew 21 and 38. St. Matthew chapter 21, verse 38. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, this is, the, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and let us seize on his inheritance. Right, because they, didn't have, they could not see. Even though they knew he was the heir, that he was the son, they could not see for their, for their lack of fear. So they, they really did, for all their knowing and all their stuff, they, that's what Christ was telling them. Hey, if, if Moses is going to accuse you, I don't have to. And the reason specifically he went into that was because that's what they professed hard by. They were experts in that, right? They were supposed to be the experts in the law of Moses. But he said, but basically, if you understood Moses, you would understand me and you would have seen all things. Letting you know they never really had that fear of the Lord. Come on. And they caught him and cast him out of the vineyard and slew and him. And that's going into his crucifixion. Come on now. When the Lord there therefore of the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto those husbandmen? He said, hey, so when when God visits the earth, what do you think he's going to do to those husbandmen in those last days? Come on. They say unto him, he will miserably destroy those wicked men. That's right. That, that's what's meat for them. For them to be destroyed. Come on. And will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen. And he's going to get other husbandmen to take care of his vineyard. Come on. Which shall render him the fruits in their seasons. And it said he will render him the fruits in their seasons. Meaning they're going to give, that's that prophecy fulfilling of, you hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. That's what the Pharisees were supposed to do. That was the tower that was set up. That was the way they were supposed to roll. And they didn't do it. So he says, not only is he going to kill them, they will be replaced. Remember how we read uh, how uh, the order of Melchizedek, the priesthood that, that was not written about, right? And then I brought out how it says, we are that nation of kings and priests. So now, when I said the husband made Ezekiel, and you, earlier you said us, no, here it's us, right? So now, we are those husbandmen now. Uh, let me get Acts 13 and 46. And I might have to wrap up the rest of this uh, down the road. The book of Acts, chapter 13, verse 46. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you. But seeing you put it from you, and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, Lo, we turn to the Gentiles. Right? So, again, it was necessary. Why? Because they were supposed to go to them first. Right? It says the tents of Judah must be raised first. He goes, but seeing that the Pharisees turned it away, essentially, it says, lo, we go, we turn to the Gentiles. We already established who the Gentiles are. Right? So the apostles' ministry is what we're speaking about versus the Pharisees' ministry is what wound up happening. So the her first husbandman was the Pharisees, that's that priesthood. And after that, you get what? The apostles' ministry. What was the apostles? They were the disciples of Christ. So again, preaching that this is the way, preaching Christ. <laughs> All right, so today we're going to continue. Uh, we'll finish off the... Uh, Parable of the husbandman. Uh, let's get Matthew 21, 33. The book of St. Matthew, chapter 21, verse 33. Here another parable. There was a certain householder which was, which planted a vineyard. Who is the householder? Don't call out. Raise your hand. Well, you did it already, so raise your hand so you can give me the mic. Shalom. Most of it. How do you know that? Uh, I got the precept right here. Mm -hmm. What's the precept? Let's say. Let's Some people say it's Christ. Last week, people were saying it's Christ. Let <laughs> me get back to you. 
Uh, we got the preset. Oh, we got the preset? I got it. Re read verse 37 in the same chapter. Verse 37. But last of all, he sent unto them his son, saying, They will reverence my son. So it's not Christ. It's not the son. It's the father is the household. Right? The father is the household. Who is the vineyard? Officer Eliezer. Hey, your notebook? Uh, the vineyard is Israel. That's going to be Isaiah 5, um, verse 7. All right, let's read that real quick. Isaiah 5, for the vineyard being Israel. Oh, he got the full-size notebook. Like, you know, everybody gets like the smaller ones. He got the full-size elementary school, hardcover. <laughs> the book of Isaiah, chapter 5, verse 7. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. Okay, so that's all we needed from that. The vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. Is the house of Israel. All right. Uh, we brought out that the tower is the temple. All right. And the husbandmen are the Pharisees. Okay. And the husbandmen are the Pharisees. So <clears throat> let's read 21, 33 through 35. And then we're going to jump uh, to the remainder of the precepts that we have here. Actually, before you do that, let's get Acts 4 and 10. Acts 4 and 10. The book of Acts, chapter 4 and verse 10. Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you hold. Come on. This is the stone which was set at not of the builders, which has become the head of the corner. So it says this is the stone because uh, I'm surprised people didn't talk because the whole first half of the class was laying the foundation of who that rock was, right? Christ, that stone, the chief cornerstone. And nobody mentioned that. We actually didn't even get that deep into the parable of the husbandman yet. And nobody brought that out. So we had left off with that. It says, this is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which is become the head of the corner, right? So ye builders is talking about the Pharisees, and they set at naught Christ. Verse 12, neither is there salvation in any other. So no sacrificial law, no white Jesus, right? There's salvation. There's no salvation in any other. Come on. For there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Right, and we were talking about how there's no other name under heaven. Right, so everybody's, the name doctrine, no, you got to say Yahweh Shai and Yahweh and all that, all the different things that they put it out there. It's fine, you can say that, but you can't tie someone's salvation to that. The scripture tells you Jesus Christ. And it says, neither is there any other name under heaven presently. That we, because let me tell you, that's such a stumbling block for, for newer brothers and sisters coming into this. Especially the brothers. You newer brothers, I know you still window shop. Trust me, we know. We know you still out there watching. Hey, some of you seasoned brothers still window shop. I like the way this guy flows. I like the way, I like the way this guy, because maybe he curses a lot, right? Let's go back to Matthew 21. It's popped in my head and I thought about it. Gotta mention this. this is, they're all praises. It's a spirit. Verse 33. St. Matthew chapter 21, verse 33. Here another parable. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard and hedged it round about, and digged a winepress in it, and built a tower, and let it out to husbandmen, and went into a far country. And when the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandmen. That they might receive the fruits of it. And the husbandman took his servants and beat one and killed another and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants more than the first, and they did unto them likewise. Right? So, the Most High set up, uh, he planted a vineyard. So, meaning he designated Israel, right, as his chosen, as his son, right? And he hedged round about it. The hedge is the laws, statutes, and commandments. And he digged the wine press in it because you were supposed to bring forth more fruit, right? So he says, and he built a tower, which symbolizes the temple. And he let it out to the husbandmen, 
which are the Pharisees. And he went into a far country, right? And then it says, when the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandmen that they might receive the fruits of it. And the husbandmen took his servants and beat one and killed another and stoned another. So basically, remember, the Most High is the one that wakes us up to knowledge, right? It's not of our own volition. So he sent brothers and sisters to these. Uh, remember when Christ, when Christ said, uh, not when Christ said, when uh, where Paul said uh, of Moses, he's preached everywhere, right? So this was already established. The structure was set up, and he sent people to him. And when he sent them to these Pharisees, they did not want to receive these people that wanted this. So what he what did he do? They said these Pharisees were beating them, they were killing others, they were stoning others, right? And then he says he sent other servants more than the first, and they did unto them likewise. And he did unto them likewise. Uh, come on, read. Verse 37. But last of all, he sent unto them his son, saying, they will, they will reverence my son. So last of all, he said, hey, they will reverence my son. There's another scripture which says it was needful that the word first come to you. So he sent the son to them. Right? That, and then this is low, I turn to the Gentiles, meaning those other Israelites that they were treating like crap. So he says, he sent them. He said, they're going to reverence my son. Come on, read. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and let us seize on his inheritance. All right. So let's get Acts 7 and 51, right? We'll, we'll, we'll come back to Matthew 21 a couple times. Acts 7 and 51 to deal with the upper portion of what we just read, right? He says he sent some unto them to seek that knowledge, right? So that, so that the fruit can be uh, reaped. And he says he beat at them, he stoned them, they killed some of them. Acts 7 and 51. The book of Acts, chapter 7 and verse 51. Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do ye. Right? So he says, remember, it's the same wicked generation. Ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. Uh, the Holy Ghost, we've told you, we typically go here, when you read verse 53, it'll tell you that. It's primarily dealing with the laws, right? But there's there's more to it. Uh, part of that dealing with the laws and dealing with the Holy Ghost is that Christ even said Moses prophesied of him. So it's letting you know that they resisted it, right? Because the Holy Ghost, uh, as far as the spiritual aspect of it, is that spirit of Christ that's among us now, right? Wherever it says two or three are gathered in my name, there I am, right? We went over the way, the truth, the life, so you understand that the word, it's the spirit that quickeneth, right? All dealing with the Holy Ghost. It says they resisted it. So even though they were Pharisees in an appearance, they looked righteous, they spoke righteous, they did all the ceremonial things in righteousness, but they were not for the people. They were beating them, they were abusing them, they were lording over them. Read on. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before the coming of the just one. Right? So just like we just read in the parable, he says, which of the prophets have your fathers not persecuted? They have slain them which showed before the coming of the just one. Because the Old Testament prophesied of the one that would come. So even the prophets of old always prophesied of these things. Come on. Of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers. And now have you been the betrayers and murderers. Right? So in that parable, Christ already foresaw what was going to happen because of his ministry, right? And these Pharisees, these uh, husbandmen, these first husbandmen that were there, were not going to deal right with it. Come on. Who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. And the angels meaning those prophets, meaning those that came before and gave the law. And it says, and they have not kept it. Now, again, you have to have context to that. Where is the one where it says, uh, where it talks about you should have had mercy, and it says you should have done one and not forget the other? You know where that, somebody looked that up. I can't remember where it is. You got it? You know exactly where it is? Oh, praise Put that up. The book of St. Matthew, chapter 23, verse 23. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin. And have omitted the weightier matters of the law. Right, so they look, they do all the outward, the ceremonial stuff. So much like a lot of brothers and sisters that they, they, they come with their phylacteries, they come with their shaloms, their attendance is perfect. 
But behind the scenes, they murmuring, gossiping, backbiters, right? Come on. Judgment, mercy, and faith. He says those are the weightier matters of the law. So when, when scriptures speak about the weightier matters, it says the weightier matters are what? Judgment? Judgment, uh -huh. mercy, and faith. Judgment, mercy, and faith. That's what we as leaders deal with. This is the stuff that when we did the officers meeting, whenever we're coaching you brothers, we tell you, hey, this is how you got to deal with this situation. You got to consider this is a weightier matter, right? It's one thing. Listen, something that's something to rebuke somebody for not wearing fringes, that's not a weighty matter. Well, you do it or you don't. There's no, there's no context for me there. There's no context in that scenario where you should not be wearing your fringes. People, you work at McDonald's or, or, or the dress code. You work at McDonald's and you're saying, uh, you assist them. Let's just say, for an example, you work at McDonald's and you're saying that uh, uh, I have to wear pants at work because McDonald's won't let me wear a skirt. Well, have you ever tried? Have you ever asked? Guess what? McDonald's does sell skirts for uniform stuff. So judgment, mercy. Uh, what else? Judgment, mercy. And faith. And faith. Those are weightier matters. Even faith is a heavier matter than all that ceremonial stuff. Come on. These are ye have done, and not to leave the other under. Ah, but it doesn't mean the other should not be done. It doesn't mean the other is trivial. So he was telling the Pharisees, you should have done these weightier matters and consider judgment, mercy, mercy for those northern kingdom that were coming back, but because of the split, they had this hatred for them, right? And it says, and faith. And it says, you should have done these and not forget the other. That's another cup for Christianity that says, oh, no, all it is is faith and this and mercy and that's it. No, you still do these things and not forget the other, right? Is that it? Okay, let's go back to Acts now. 7 and 53. Acts chapter 7, verse 53. Who have received the law by the dispensation of angels and have not kept it. Read on. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth. You know, they say the truth hurts, right? People don't like to hear the truth. So they'll attack you. They get defensive, right? So it says they were cut to the heart because they knew it to be true. Come on. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Right, so this was Stephen. He said he was full of the Holy Ghost and he was able to see, right? Because he was about to get killed. So he saw the most high. So people tell you their vision of heaven and I saw a white light and all my friends were there and people from all nations were there. No, the scripture tell you, you're going to look up and you're going to see the most high and his son on the right hand. So when it's your time to go, if you see anything else, you're not going where you need to go. <laughs> if you don't see the Ancient of Days with his fro and his son looking just like him, black, rolling there, you in the wrong place. <laughs> you, you, you see in the wrong thing. Go ahead, read. And said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. Come on. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, Lay not this sin to their charge. Now, man, I see this is why you gotta marinate on these scriptures. And you gotta look and you gotta really look at this. Stephen was so righteous and understood this when they say he was filled with the Holy Ghost. See, because us, I'll be mad as hell, right? In that moment. You know what it is to be stoned to die, right? I would have been picking up rocks, throwing it back at him. I ain't going out like that. You know, a lot of y'all would have that mentality too. And he no. said, don't lay this to their charge. Hey, and think about stoning. You know, the best thing that I've seen in a movie about stoning was um, uh, there's two. There's, I can't remember one name of the movie where they bury somebody up to their neck. Right? Oh, it was her waist? I seen one. No, I think I saw one up to the neck or like up to here. And so you're not blocking nothing, right? You're like, you're not doing this and blocking. And they just throwing stones at you till you die. So that means broken, beat up, jacked up. And then I have seen one in that show Spartacus, I think in the third season, 
He goes to the little town, and they got the guy up against the wall, and they stoning him. But he's not dying. They just hurting him. So he took pity on his people. Right? Spartacus was Israel, so that means they were stoning an Israelite. As mockery, they did that to us because they knew that that was what was in our law. But they did it for their delight. And he took a rock because he was trying to be incognito. And since he was Spartacus, right, and he was bad, with one blow, he was able to kill the guy. So he had mercy on his brother, and he killed him because stoning didn't go that way. No, you ever seen regular people who have no, not an ounce, an ounce of athleticism in them throw something? You don't want that person stoning you, but that's what would stone you because you're not going to die. You want somebody that's going to bullseye you, you die as quick as you can, and that's it. So my point is, I'm trying to create a picture that it, it wasn't that he was just being stoned. He was going through a painful thing of them freaking, remember, they said they rushed on him with one accord. That means he couldn't run. That means they probably bound him up to stone him, right? And it says, and he kneeled down, come on, and cried with a loud voice. Go ahead. Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Right? The Most High had mercy on him so that he didn't have to suffer. He said, lay not this sin on their charge. So he was in the spirit enough to say that. And it's because he also understood what Christ was preaching about the husbandman. All right? So this is one manifestation of what Christ was preaching there about the husbandman. Let's go back to that. Matthew 21. And let's read... Uh, 36 again. Now, actually, start at uh, 35. St. Matthew chapter 21, verse 35. And the husbandman took his servants and beat one and killed another and stoned another. And we just read an example of that in Acts. Come on. Again, he sent other servants more than the first, and they did unto them likewise. But last of all, he sent unto them his son, saying, they will reverence my son. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, this is, the, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and let us seize on his inheritance. And like I brought out last week, they knew he was the Christ. It wasn't ignorance. They knew it. John 11 and 47. They knew it. And within themselves, for all that they professed and all that they preached, they were not able to to abide by what the word. They resisted the Holy Ghost, like what we just read in Acts 7. And it says, just as their fathers did. Why? Because it's the same spirit. So let's get John 11 and 47. St. John chapter 11, verse 47. Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council and said, What do we? For this man doth many miracles. If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him. And the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. Right? So it says, hey, they knew that all people would believe on him. And he said, if we leave him alone, if we don't do something about this, we don't kill him. It says, then all of them will come and they'll worship him. And we're going to lose our place. They were more concerned. They, they forgot that their role as husbandmen was not as the household. They were reckless with the heritage of the Most High. As husbandmen, it was lent out to them, that heritage. They were supposed to be stewards over the people until Christ came. Right, right. That's the T.D. Jakes. That's all these uh, wolves in sheep's clothing that are out there. And they don't got to be the famous pastors, whatever pastors y'all were with. And if you were in Catholicism, whatever priest y'all were listening to. And they were reckless with it. And they were reckless with it, and they were destructive with it. Get John 5 and 43. St. John chapter 5 and verse 43. I am come in my Father's name, and ye receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him ye will receive. Remember, we read in the parable, he said, I will send to my son. Then they will, he will reverence. And they did it. It said, they said amongst themselves, this is the heir. We, our time of rulership is over. I was recently re-watching um, the Lord of the Rings stuff. The Hobbit, the Lord of the Rings was on HBO Max. And uh, this reminded me of, uh, if, if y'all have seen it, you remember the steward of Gondor, right? And uh, notice, there's a couple of things you got to notice. When you go into the throne room, he's not sitting on the throne. He's sitting on a seat right next to the throne, right? Because he was the caretaker of the throne. 
But he had that Pharisee spirit because he told him, he goes, I know your deception. I know of this Aragorn, this ranger. He was like, he's not, he's not a king. We're not going to let him set up. This is basically, he said, this is mine. I'm not going to lose my seat. So he, he acknowledged that he wasn't the king. Same way like the Pharisees here. They knew that they were at the top dog, but they did not want to lose that, that comfy place of stewardship. And, and in his evilness, at, right before he died by fire, he came to his senses, but he was already on fire and jumped off the thing, right? And, but all the while, he was so obsessed with not giving up his rulership that he was resistant to it. He even sent his own son, his second son, because the first one died. You remember the movie? He even sent his own son to die because he didn't want to believe uh, that he was going to let this king come back and take over the throne. So it's that same type of mindset. That's The Pharisees were in that seat. If you're familiar with that movie, I'm just trying to paint a visual. If not, understand, they were in the caretaker seat. It's kind of like the assistant manager. You haven't seen the movie? Kind of like the assistant manager. Not the same as when the store manager there, right? The assistant manager is, so when the store managers are seen, the store manager is in charge. In absence of that is the assistant manager. The store manager don't come in and start saying, do this, this, and move people around. The assistant manager's like, nah, B. Don't go that way. You're going to lose your damn job. All right? Where are we at? Go ahead. Verse 44. 44. How can ye believe which receive honor one of another and seek not the honor that cometh from God right? only? And you know what the manifestation of honor one of another was? How long was the high priest supposed to serve? Go ahead, Officer Lee. Until he died. And what were they doing? Uh, they were judging matters. They were alternating who sat. So they had honor one of another. So they weren't even keeping the law on that. But they had honor one of another, saying, Hey, come on, let me let me let me serve for a little while. Let me be the high priest now so I can get the benefits of that. All right, all right. Next year you be the high priest. All right. So so they, they were reckless with God's heritage. So they had honor one of another, but they said they couldn't receive honor that comes from the Most High. Come on. Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There was one that accused you, even Moses, in whom he trusts. Why? Because they knew it was a lifetime post, and they were dealing messed up with it anyway, amongst many other things. Come on. For had he believed Moses, he would have believed me, for he wrote of me. So he's like, hey, the stuff that I'm talking up to you is the stuff that you know is in that law. But remember, we read in the parable, they knew he was the heir. They just did not want to lose their seat. Come on. But if ye believe not his writings, how shall ye believe my word? Hey, and they would fancy themselves as devout believers because of the uh, the anise, right? The cumin, the tithing, all that stuff that they did, the incense. But they were not fully believing. Letting you know that, uh, and remember, Christ said, "What you still should do uh, the other too. But don't forget the weighty amount. Let me know that the other stuff is, it can be just appearance. You cannot measure your righteousness based on the outward appearance. Right? Go ahead. So the Pharisees were well learned in law and prophecy and scriptures, right? Just like today, you have some brothers that they're very learned, right? But they were never really all about the truth. At the end of the day, the Pharisees were never really about this because they saw Christ. Miracle, they knew, like like Cap said in the scripture, said they knew that he was Christ, but they still went ahead and they really it shows they weren't really rooted because we know the, the, the scriptures, right? And for the most part, we go ahead and we say, All right, this is what it is, we haven't seen it, but we believe. They actually saw this man walking and doing all these miracles, and they were supposed to be Pharisees. They prophesied of a Messiah coming, and when he came, they didn't believe him. Go figure that. Right, right. And we're going to cover that right now. Romans 16 and 17. Watch. Romans 16, we're going to be 17 and 18. Right. No, he, uh, Paul's going to bring it out right here in Romans uh, in the 18 verse. But we'll start at uh, 16 and 17. The book of Romans, chapter 16, verse 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. Right. So saying that. Uh, he's not the Christ, and he was not at that time. I'm talking about at that time. We use this for modern days so you can understand uh, the multitude of uh, doctrine that it covers. 
But this is the point of what uh, Captain Apocalypse is saying, verse 18. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. And by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. So they were even preaching that a Messiah would come. But they served their own belly. And it was with these good words and fair speeches and looking so righteous and pious, right? But in their heart, you could see that they were not about that. They were, they were quick to put their brothers and sisters to death for things that they themselves were not keeping, for things they that themselves did not believe. So there's the hypocrisy, right? Psalms 111 and 10. Right. And I think I did a class with the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. So if you have those notes and you want more detail, on that, refer to that. The book of Psalms, chapter 111 and verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all they that do his commandments. So they did not really fear God. It's like Catherine Parr was saying. Because it says the fear of the Lord is that it gives you that wisdom. And it says a good understanding of all they that keep their commandments. Christ blessed them and said, hey. You should have done one and not forget the other, but it was incomplete. This is also why he says, your righteousness has to exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. Because we're supposed to do one and not forget the other. So again, yes, we are supposed to keep the atonement, supposed to keep the high holy days, do all those things, as well as the weightier matters of judgment, mercy, and faith that we're supposed to reflect upon. Let me get Sirach 21 and 11. The book of Sirach, chapter 21 and verse 11. He that keepeth the law of the Lord getteth the understanding thereof. And the profession of the fear of the Lord is wisdom. The so if you focus on perfecting the fear of the Lord, you will receive wisdom, right? And he says, if you keep the law of the Lord, that's how you get understanding. So not to say that you should never have questions, but it, okay, I brought this out before. If your knowledge is not increasing, then you have to work on these steps here. Maybe there's some laws you're not keeping. Maybe there's something that's not right. Maybe you don't have the proper dose of fear in you for that to increase. Come on, read. Verse 12. He that is not wise will not be taught. And listen to what he says there. He says that you have to perfect the fear of the Lord to get wisdom. But he says you're, if, if you're not wise, you will not be taught. Because the most basic wisdom is you don't know what you don't know, and you allow yourself to be taught rather than try to frame your own understanding, right? Come on. But there is a wisdom which multiplies bitterness. In your own devices, in your own eye, right? Uh, there's a scripture in Proverbs. I can't remember exactly what it is now. We don't need to go there, but it says, all the ways of man are clean in his own eyes. And it says, but there is a wisdom which multiplies bitterness. Why? Because you feel like you're not getting the respect you deserve. You know so many priests. Remember, I brought this out lately a lot. The no, that's a brother that knows a lot. That sister knows a lot of scriptures. But you don't have no wisdom. And then you get bitter inside of yourself. And that's when you start resenting everybody around you. You resent leadership. You resent the organization. You're a mess. Right. That's the same spirit as the Pharisees. That's the same spirit. Right. Right. Verse 13. The knowledge of a wise man. Shall bound like a flood, and his counsel is like a pure fountain right, of life. This is what was supposed to be sought at the Pharisees, but it did not happen that way. It says, The knowledge of a wise man shall abound like a flood, and his counsel is like a pure fountain of life. The counsel that you receive is like a pure fountain of life. It's that you're not gonna get guided into some wrong decisions and some wrong type of judgment. The way to your matters. Come on. The inner parts of a fool are like a broken vessel, and he will hold no knowledge as long as he liveth. That's heavy because that goes into the outward appearance. That verse is saying a lot. It says the inner part of a fool are like a broken vessel, right? So that's like if I have this cup here, and it has holes all through the bottom, right? But the holes are back here, and you can't see them, right? And I'll tell this, and I'll pull this up, and it looks nice, and I'll say, hey, this cup is full. And you're like, yeah, man, that thing is full. And every time I pour some understanding in there, back here where you can't see it, it's all pouring out. That's how some of you are. And that's exactly how the Pharisees were. 
looking like you're full of understanding, looking like you know all this and know all that, and inwardly you're a broken vessel. Trying to sound deep, and no knowledge stays inside of you. It's like uh, it's like when my mom used to say, "Friends are like a dollar in your pocket." I never understood that till I got older, because your pockets get holes, and when when the, the dollar falls through the hole, they gone. They only there for a time. Is the purpose that she is that she's saying? Some of y'all, you get wisdom for a dispensation of time, and if you don't shore up those inward parts, patch them holes that you got in your inner vessel, you're gonna wind up falling away. It's just a matter of time. Some of y'all will hang on for 10 or 15 years and wind up falling away because outwardly you, you were you were the cup, but inside you was all broke, nothing in there. Matthew 21 and 38. Saying Matthew chapter 21 and verse 38. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him. And let us seize on his inheritance. Right. They did not want to give up the stewardship. Right. Like I like I said about the example with the Lord of the Rings. Right. That last movie, The Return of the King. He, they didn't want the return of the king. They didn't want that thing to happen. They said, let's kill him and we'll seize his inheritance. Forgetting that they were just caretakers. Come on. And they caught him and cast him out of the vineyard and slew him. And they crucified him. Come on. When the Lord therefore the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto those husbandmen? Right? When, so hey, so you gotta think about that. When the Lord of of the vineyard cometh, what's he gonna do unto those husbandmen that were supposed to be just stewards? Read on. They say unto him, He will miserably, miserably destroy those wicked men, and will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen. He says, Those people are going to be destined for death and destruction. And he is going to set up new husband. When he says let out, that means like lend it. That means like put in someone's care. So he's going to put new stewards over that heritage. Come on. Which shall render him the fruits in their seasons. Right. So other husbandmen. Let's get Acts 13 and 46. And, the, and this is what Captain Apart was saying. When we were going over history. But it pertains to us because we are those new husbandmen. We are those new ones that are supposed to be there and follow after that ministry. And it started with the apostles. That was the real new husbandmen. That's why Paul, Peter, uh, all of them, John, Mark, Luke, uh, Apollos, Timothy, even Titus for a season, right? Everybody that they mentioned, those were the new husbandmen. No longer were they going to go and be abused and not get the full understanding, right? Those were the new husbandmen. And we follow in those footsteps today. You hear about the apostolic ministry a lot. Christianity uses that term, right? Um, the apostles' ministry is what we follow after. This is why you'll see a lot of brothers, uh, Bishop Kanai does it um, a lot when he would be on trips and stuff. And he would say, this is the acts of the apostles. Because we are those new husbandmen in these last days that are let out over the king. So those of us who are in leadership for the right reasons, that's what you have to understand has been granted into your care. The Most High has seen it fit for you to be a husbandman to his heritage, to his vineyard. And now there's no physical temple, but it's the little sanctuaries, right? And, and the fruit that we bear is from this proper understanding of the full Bible. Old, Apocrypha, New Testament, right? Go ahead, uh, read this, Acts 13, 46. The book of Acts, chapter 13, verse 46. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you. Meaning, he, they had to go to the Pharisees first. Come on. But seeing ye put it from you, and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. Because remember, when the Holy Spirit came on to Christ, where did he go? He said immediately, he went into the synagogue. And as was the custom, he read. And he said, and he read, he read a scripture that prophesied of him in the Old Testament. And he said, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your eye, in your ear. And they all, some were shocked, some were pissed off. Said, who the hell is he saying this stuff? And of course, right, you would be suspect at first, right? Somebody random just come in. Remember, they said he wasn't comely. Well, he came in and looked like he was anybody of any particular esteem. 
because they knew him as the carpenter's son. He went up, but then after, right, right after that, what did he do? He started going out and doing miracles and healing people and doing all types of things, speaking all types of wisdom. They were astonished. Who taught this man letter? What is this? And and the signs that if they would have only been in the right mind, that they would have seen was prophecy being fulfilled. Remember, I always tell you that it says this was done so that this would be fulfilled of what was said. And they overlooked all that, and the people forgot that stuff. Read that again, forty six. Verse 46, then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing you put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. So he said, hey, so now we're going to go to the scattered and dispersed. Now we're going to go, remember, like it says, uh, what is it, John 7, 35, where will he go? Will he go into dispersed among the Gentiles and teach the Gentiles? says among the Gentiles and then teach the Gentiles, the dispersed. You got to know what that's saying. He said, hey, we're going to go to these Israelites that you guys were beating and forbidding to come to repentance. Because they were doing that even before Christ was on the scene. So it wasn't just Christ. That's what the, um, the Samaritan is about. That was their behavior. And he was like, who's better? This Samaritan, basically, that doesn't keep any laws, right? But stopped to help his brother. He kept the royal law. And the rest of y'all who are so righteous and pious just kept walking by because he was a Samaritan. Because he was whatever. He just was like whatever. But the Samaritan, who, who doesn't keep any of those laws, was in the right spirit to stop and help him. Esau takes that and says, this is why you must be a good neighbor. To Remember, your neighbors are the Israelites. That's right? right? That's right. who your neighbors are. That's who your neighbors are. Not just, not just, not just anybody else. Where? Acts 13? Oh, uh, go ahead. Read 45. Verse 45. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blasphemy. Contradicting what he was saying about them being able to come back. Remember, it said that I will provoke you to a jealousy with, with a nation that was, uh, gosh, I just called it. But you know which one I'm talking about. Right. And that's, that, that was the fulfillment of that prophecy. They were filled with envy. They had that jealousy because that was happening, right? Let me get Acts 11 and 19. The book of Acts, chapter 11, verse 19. Now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen. We read the persecution, right? Where he came and he gave them knowledge and history. He, he had to remind all them Pharisees. Of what, they, of what their evil wouldn't let them see. And they killed them for it. So it says many scattered after that because they were fit. They said, damn, if we profess Christ and profess these things that are true in the Bible, we're going to be persecuted too. Right? Come on. Traveled as far as Phoenice and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. Right? So at that time, they were preaching them unto the Jews only. That's going into that Israel, right? Even though it says Jew, the Jews only equals Israel. Why? Because this is talking about the church in Antioch. It's letting you know that those were the same people that were coming back to preach that. And they did not like that. That's why he. That's why they killed Stephen. Because he cut them on their own stuff and was reminding them that the script, basically he taught them. They're like, who are you to teach me? That hey, these Gentiles can come back into the fold. This is that wild olive branch, right? That's going to be grafted back in. So it says they were scattered abroad. So even though it says Jews only here, it means all Israel. Meaning they did not go to preach to actual Antiochians or actual Cyprus citizens. It was Israelites that scattered to those places to avoid the persecution in Jerusalem because they were vexed because of envy and jealousy and were trying to kill anybody that was one professing Christ and two if you profess Christ, you're professing that the woman by the well and all the Samaritans could come back. And they did not want that. Right. And these were Jews that believed. Right. Right. That's the point that I'm making. It wasn't Gentiles. It's telling you that they went to Cyprus. They were in Phoenice. They were in Antioch and many other places. And this is why these letters are titled the way they are. They all dispersed. Remember Acts 2, devout Jews out of every nation. What makes you devout? Believers. Out of every nation, and they all spoke in their in their own tongue. I'm talking about Hebrew. They spoke in the tongue of where they were from, right? 
Let me get uh, Matthew 21 again. Read uh, 21 and 41 again. St. Matthew chapter 21, verse 41. They say unto him, He will miserably destroy those wicked men and will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits in their season. Come on. Jesus said unto them, Did he ever, did you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? The same is become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it it is a and it is marvelous in our eyes. So Christ is quoting the Old Testament here, right? Get Psalms 118 and 22. And he says, did you ever not read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? Remember, we went over the stone in the first part of the class talking about Christ. Those builders, otherwise known as husbandmen, all right? Those first husbandmen, they rejected that stone. He said, that's the Lord's doing. God ordained it to be that way. So that's not to have pity on the Pharisees, but to instill more fear in you that God can make you instantly reprobate if, if he so choose. That you would see and know that that's the heir, but still reject it. That's like, that's like you, you can see everything and know everything that's going on, but the words coming out of your mouth is not you in control. Your actions are not you in control. Uh, get this in Psalms. The book of Psalms, chapter 118, verse 22. The stone which the builders refuse has become the head stone of the corner. Right? So that's Christ. It said it's become the head stone of the corner. Come on. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. So Christ was exactly preaching that stuff. Remember, this is why I told him, hey, if you, if you believe Moses, you'd have believed me. Come on. This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Right? So Christ was quoting the Old Testament. He goes, that's a glorious day. Because not only did that priesthood have to be done away with, just like we read, right? They never said about a new priesthood after the order of Melchizedek. But it was ordained that that would happen that way. So along with the sacrificial law, that had to be done. That ministry of the Pharisees had to be done away with. That was God's work. It had to be done. So he had this whole thing planned out. This is what I'm saying. The level of detail. Plan, some of us, some of y'all can't even plan your day. Some, some going down in like 45 minutes and you just get to the gym. Talking about, oh, you just got here? Nah, bro, I'm done. It's about to be set. Right? Right? What was I said? I said, nah, bro, I got to get my Chipotle bowl in, fam. I'm done with this. Talking about. Let me show up to camp late. I overslept. I'm going to be sent home. That's what's going to happen. That's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to be sent home. Let's go back. Oh, uh, no. Let's go to Isaiah 28, 16. Isaiah 28 and 16. The book of Isaiah, chapter 28, verse 16. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, behold. I lay in Zion for a foundation of stone, a tried stone. So this is this is the prophecy of Christ, right? So you hear about the stone a lot. Remember, I set up the first part of the class. We're talking about that a little bit. Now you're hearing that when Christ quoted that in, in the parable of the husbandman. And he says, uh, I lay in Zion, meaning in Israel, not in the whole earth, not in for all nations. I lay in Zion a foundation. A stone, a tried stone, come on. A precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. Meaning you will keep and understand. You will not make haste to believe. And the Pharisees did not. And there are many that do not. It says you shall not make haste. Let's get First Peter 2 and 6. Like what I was saying before, the Pharisees knew this and they, it's like they could not control and it was of the Lord, right? First Peter 2 and 6. We're going to read down to 8. First Peter chapter 2, verse 6. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture. Behold, I lay in Sion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. So you see how the new quotes the old precept must be upon precept. We just read that in Isaiah. Here you're reading this in Peter. Come on. Until you, therefore, which believe, he is precious. If you believe, 
then you see that that stone is precious. Come on. But unto them which be disobedient. And see how he says not believing is being disobedient? It's not some belief has action behind it. And he says unto them that not believe, they're disobedient. They're disobedient. So your behavior shows your belief. Them that believe are going to do the things that God requires of you. Come on. The stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. Come on. And the stone of stumbling and the rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. Ooh, so there's two things here. That's heavy. That's heavy. First part, he says Christ to some, to those disobedient, is a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. There's a scripture that says, blessed is he who is not offended in me. And this lets you know and this solidifies even more that this whole Christianity, love, and don't be offensive and all that stuff, that's P.S. It says Christ is a offense. It's a rock of offense. There's controversy around this. So y'all best believe that whenever I see the adversity against us, it reaffirms and reinforces my faith even more. And, and, and it shores up that I know that I'm in the right walk and in the right battle and on the right side of that thing. Don't ever waver what to the left or to the right on this thing. Because all the hate, all the uh, uh, things that come our way because of this, you're in the right place. Because if you win anything else, I've said this before, everybody and everyone will be accepting of you. It's so bad that Christianity is starting to bend and mold to the Sodom agenda. That you got the Pope even saying, like, yeah. He said, so now they're coming out and they're saying, well, he didn't say marriage, but he said there should be some sort of civil union between them. And remember, Catholicism or Christianity is, is uh, under that umbrella of Catholicism. And, and you've seen it. You're starting to see it more prevalent now. You got the, uh, I think I told you, you have the first gentleman of the church since the gay pastor instead of the first lady of the church is the first gentleman. You got, you got two uh, primmed up, metrosexual looking brothers on there just he the first he the first gentleman they call him uh and then it says it's an offense to them even to them which stumble at the word being disobedient right because the law is what makes you stumble at it. remember people they they're all for yeah we're special yeah the white man's the devil all that stuff like that but they stumble when you say oh but you can't do this oh but you gotta do this you gotta keep this and that's really what keeps me. Listen, if we just preached identity and then did everything else like the Christian church, uh, uh, we'd be full. We'd have 10 churches just in Phoenix alone. We'll be give turkeys on Thanksgiving, do toy drives for children for Christmas. We'd be full to the brim. To the brim. With our people. Talk about, yeah, we Israel. And we not keeping any laws. All types of madness and craziness going on. But then it says here in the last verse, whereunto also they were appointed. That's what they were made for. They were made for the disobedience. You need tinder for the fire. Yeah, hey, we start a fire, you don't just start it out of anywhere, right? Yeah, you, you, you got something to, to, to start it up. You need some coals, you need some tinder, right? You need a piece of wood to get it going, right? And then you just feed it there. So then they tinder for the fire. Tinder for the fire. Let me get uh, Isaiah 8 and 14. They were appointed to disobedience. They were made to be disobedient. Right. Isaiah, Isaiah 8 and 14. I saw a sister, I think, on one of the videos asked, what does it mean when it says they are not all Israel that are of the stock of Abraham? That's what it's talking about. That's what it's talking about. Because it's not just by blood. It's blood. And the spirit, and the spirit is keeping the commandments. That's the works, right? Uh, Isaiah 8 and 14. The book of Isaiah, chapter 8, verse 14. And he shall be for a sanctuary. That's what Christ is. Come on. But for a stone of stumbling and for a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel. To both houses of Israel. And if the Pharisees had only remembered that, so it says there will be two houses of Israel. But a house divided cannot stand. This is why Ezekiel 37 says the two sticks must become one. 
we must come together because no more two houses, but we have to unite under one. Come on, read. To both the houses of Israel for a gin and for a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many among them shall stumble and fall and be broken and be snared and be taken. Because they did not want to receive that the other house of Israel can come back. They did not want to receive that thing. That's why Paul had to go at such length when you read about the wild olive tree being grafted back in. That's why uh, him and Barnabas had a strong contention about that. That's why Peter, we brought it out uh, where he was kind of like standoffish, right? When the circumcision were there, not the uncircumcision. And it says it would be an offense to people. Come on. Bind up the testimony. Seal the law among my disciples. So now that should have new meaning for you. Because part of the testimony is that the two houses of Israel will become one. You cannot say that you believe in the Most High in Christ if you do not believe in both houses coming back together. Keeping the law, statutes, commandments, and the faith of Christ. And it says, seal the law among my disciples. My disciples. So we're trying to get to the point of who these other husbandmen are. And those second husbandmen that it was let out to started with the disciples. It started with the 12 and then everybody else that I mentioned, Paul, uh, um, Titus, Apollos, all the others that preached the true understanding of Christ. Let's go back to Matthew 21. Read 42 and 43. St. Matthew chapter 21. 42. Verse 42. Jesus said unto them, Did he never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? The same is become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. The reason that it's marvelous in our eyes is because it's the unification of the two houses of Israel. It's a step closer to our redemption and going home. He says, Did you never read that in the scriptures? Because what? We should have. We all should know this. Right? And I didn't even go into it deep right now with the stone. I just went through a few in relation to the class. Read on. Therefore say unto I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. Right? So this is what it was. When it says the kingdom of God, see Christianity takes that. So this is why you got to understand the parable of the husbandman. And they take that to mean that it was taken from the Israelites and given to the heathen. It was taken from the first husbandmen as the caretakers and given to new caretakers. That's what that's speaking about. Not that it was taken from the Jews and from Israel and put to the some people who never dealt with God. That's why it, and that's why it's a parable. He spoke in parables. Right? They never, never. It says, they, what have you to do with my statutes and my commandments to keep them? It says, the statutes and judgments were given only unto Jacob. Selah, praise be the Lord. That's what it's speaking about. So you get this one verse in Christianity and say, no, 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 this is what's going on here. Right? This is why the parable is so, and this isn't even that heavy of a parable if you got the little background that I gave you with the history. It really isn't. But they'll confound you if you don't know it. And they'll trip you up in this, right? So he says, uh, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you. Remember, when we read in the, uh, verse 31, he was talking about the husbandmen. So he says, it's going to be taken from you, husbandmen, and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. It didn't say another nation. It didn't say another people, right? The nation bringing forth the fruits thereof is the two houses of Israel coming together. Let me get Ezekiel 37 and 19. The book of Ezekiel, chapter 37, verse 19. I don't know about y'all, but when I read this stuff, this stuff gets me excited. It gets me excited I can see it. It gets me excited that it's revealed. Like, like I get hyped. I'm like, damn, man, I'm proud to be an Israelite. Like, this, this thing is great. Freaking liars out there. Ezekiel 37 and 19. Verse 19. Say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel, his fellows, and will put them with him 
even with the stick of Judah. Those two houses will not be divided anymore. Come on. And make them one stick, and they shall be one in mine hand. They shall be one in his hand. Come on. <laughs> and the sticks whereon thou writest shall be in thine hand before their eyes. Come on. And say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen. Look at that. Look at how detailed that is. I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen. Just like we read in Acts 11 and was it 19? And it said that they went to Phoenice, they went to Cyprus, they went to Antioch. All the places that were scattered today. And he says, I'm going to take them from among the heathen. Just like John 7.35, the dispersed among the Gentiles and teach the Gentiles. Come on. Whether they be gone and will gather them on every side and bring them into their own land. Come on. And I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel. Yeah, just like we read in the prophecy, he said a nation, a nation that will bring forth the fruits. So he says, and I will make them one nation. That's the nation in the prophecy, in the parable of the husbandman that we're reading about. Come on. And one king shall be king to them all. And that one, and one king, not an alternating high priest that's full of wickedness. One king, Christ. Come on. And and they shall be no more two nations. Neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms anymore at all. And neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms anymore at all. Back to Matthew 21, read verse 43, and we're going to go down to 46. Matthew chapter 21, verse 43. Therefore I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. The kingdom of God will be taken from the first husbandmen that were stewards. Remember, he said he's going to let it out to other husbandmen. And those other husbandmen is basically both tribes coming together as one nation and teaching the proper understanding. Come on. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken. And if you try, that's when you kick against the pricks. You're going to fall on that stone that's Christ, you will be broken. Come on. But on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. Ooh, you don't want you don't want the most highest judgment to come upon you. It says, Christ fall on you. It says, it will grind him to powder. Come on. And when the chief priests and Pharisees had heard his parables, they perceived that he spake of them. <laughs> of course they did. They said they heard the parables. Hey, and that's another thing right there in the same chapter that shows you they can't use that to say that it was taken from them and give it to another nation. It's talking about the chief priests and Pharisees. It says they perceive that he spoke for the... Are you talking about me? No, we say if the shoe fits. We say if, it fit. if you got to ask yourself, are we talking about you? We probably talking about you. If you're clueless, all praises. That means it's not you. Come on. But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitude because they took him for a prophet. So they they were so pissed in that moment they were going to kill him. After he just gave them the parable of them killing him. And they said, well, we ain't going to do it because all these people here, they're going to stick up for him, right? Kind of like what Cap was bringing out uh, on the feast day about how uh, the police were there trying to protect us from the mobs and stuff like that, right? So it says the people there, though, they were ready to protect Christ at that point because they believed. He was a prophet. Let me get First Peter two and five. First Peter chapter two verse five. He also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house in holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Lively stones. Lively stones. What makes us lively stones? Uh, let me get Acts 7 and 38 is what I was going to go to. And there's a reason that I want this one. The book of Acts, chapter 7 and verse 38. Amen. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spake to him in the Mount Sinai and with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us. What are the lively oracles? Prophesize it. You better, you better not say the commandments because it basically just went into this is he that was in the church of the wilderness. 
what is it? Who was he that was in the church in the wilderness? Moses yeah, Moses. Okay. I'm not dealing with Christ when I was dealing with Moses. How did Moses deliver the oracles? Tables of stone. Tables of stone. He didn't know. He was just going to, uh, no, until he got gonna it. No, nope. you were going to, uh, you would have just said it. You late. You late. Just like you were to the gym last night. Enter camp. <laughs> He's like, come on, man. Can I get over it? When we see a consistent pattern of change. Until then, we will haze you vigorously on that. The lively oracles were those stones, right? The tables of stone. That this way say this was he that gave this. It says those were lively oracles. They were written on stone. So when now, when you read, go back where it says we are lively stones, and Peter, if you want to bring the one you got in, uh, what you got, Pat. First Peter chapter 2, verse 5. Verse 5. Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house. So yes, John 6 63 is good, but I want to deal with the stones. The, the stones was the tables of stones. So what is he saying? Remember all the classes we've been going through the past couple months. He says, the New Testament, the laws will be written in our heart, right? So we are lively stones. Those stones were dead with a writing. We live those commandments. So when it says, ye also as lively stones, we are the embodiment of those laws, those statutes and commandments. We live them. Come on. In holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices. We are that holy priesthood. We are those next husbandmen. That it is led out to the heritage. Come on. Acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Not by being from the uh, lineage of Aaron. Not by being in the Levitical priesthood. But by the order of Melchizedek. Which is under Christ. We are those lively stones. Right. I got uh, one more. So about 35 and 1. And then I. Uh, no. I mean I got more for the class. I got a few more. But uh, the book so of Sirach. Chapter 35 and verse 1. He that keepeth the law bringeth offerings enough. Because it says spiritual sacrifices. We offer up spiritual sacrifices. Not animal sacrifices anymore. Spiritual sacrifices. Read this again. He that keepeth the law bringeth offerings enough. So again, lively stones, keeping the law. He who keepeth it, give offering enough. Those are our spiritual sacrifices by keeping the laws. Come on. He that taketh heed to the commandments offereth a peace offering. He that taketh heed to the commandments offers a peace offering. Just like we had the peace offering of the turtle dove and all that under the old covenant, us just keeping the laws gives that, those spiritual sacrifices and all that. The lively stones is us living those commandments. That's what that's speaking about. Uh, okay. The book of Proverbs, chapter 7 and verse 2. Keep my commandments. Stop. It says, keep my commandments. The action. Keep my commandments. Go ahead. And live. And do what? And live. And live. Go ahead. And my, all, and my law as the apple of thine eye. When something's the apple of your eye, it's not quite hard. Beautiful state. Fruit of fruit. All praises. All praises. Actually, read verse 3. Bind them upon thy fingers. Write them upon the table of thine heart. The table upon thy heart. Your mind. Again, lively stones. Lively stones. What that's going into. Let me get Ephesians 2 and 20. Two twenty. Yes, sir. The book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verse 20. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ himself. Being the chief cornerstone. Right? So we're talking about moving into what is that apostle's ministry. It says the foundation now is not the foundation of what the Pharisees built. But it says we are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Because it was always meant to be that way. And the Pharisees did not. They, they took that stewardship and they trashed it underfoot. Come on. In whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto in holy temple in the Lord. All the building means both houses of Israel. Unto whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord. 
So now that temple that's in the vineyard becomes us and not that physical temple under the new husbandman that it's led out to. Come on. In whom ye also are built together for the habitation of God through the Spirit. So that now we are built together as a habitation of God through the Spirit so that God can reside with us. Now we follow the apostles' ministry and those of us, and that's what we're in. That's the acts of the apostles. You're going out and doing those flying missions? That's the acts of the apostles. You're going out and doing camp? That's the acts of the apostles. You're doing fundraising? That's the acts of the apostles. Because you read in Acts 4 and in Acts 2 about the economy that they had, right? Acts 4 tells you how people came, they set the stuff at their feet, they distributed as they had need. I just told you on Monday, we just were able to buy the building, the, the second church that we own, uh, the second building in North Carolina. We're already lining up two more states, if it be the Lord's will. Little by little, we're going to get there. And when the Lord sees that we're doing what he's driving us to do, see, we're thinking, oh, it's going to take five years, it's going to take ten years for, us, for, for all schools we have to be on. But that thing might be done in five. It might be done less. And that's significant in and of itself. Because now we're not succumbing. Those little sanctuaries are important to set up. We don't got to deal with these different rules and regulations and all that stuff. Let me get 1 Corinthians 3 and 10. The book of 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation. And another built it thereon. Right. So then Paul and the apostles laid the foundation and another built it thereon. In that time, right, he was dealing with the disputation between one is of Apollos, one is of Paul. But scriptures are of eternal. They laid the foundation and we are others building upon it. Come on. But let every man take heed how he built it thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay that is laid. Which is Jesus Christ. We can't try. Listen, remember what happened when they tried to lay another foundation. They wanted to kill Christ and lay their own. They said they want to take the inheritance. It says there's no other foundation that anyone can lay. It said that that stone will grind you. It will break you. You cannot go against. You can't do anything against God but for it. You can't do anything against the truth but for it. You can try all you want. But even in that, remember how it said they were appointed to disobedience? You try to do that. you probably appointed to disobedience. You're going to be ground to powder. Come on, read. Now if any man built upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. That's going into all the different types of works and all the different type of Israelites that will be built upon that foundation. Come on. Every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. Right? So, right, gold, that's going to survive the fire. Silver, that's going to survive the fire. Precious stone, that's going to survive the fire. And then you got tinder, wood, hay, and stubble. That stuff ain't going to abide. Come on. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. And the fire is going to try that work. If it's hay, wood, because you might think yourself, I shall do it. Sisters there thinking that, right? You might be some stubble, sister. You might get burned up with the stubble, thinking you a precious stone. Let me get 2 Timothy 2.19. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. Hey, no matter what, the foundation of God standeth sure. Come on. Having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. Having this seal, God knows who are his. He knows who are appointed to disobedience, who are not. He knows who is real and who not. That's why we, we're not going to make too big of a deal, depending on, I mean, this, there are exceptions. But, right, we, you, we're not going to go by appearance or, or last name, per se. Like, if, you know, like, if you have a German last name and you say you get, we go wrong with that. And you look like Esau, we're going to roll with that. We're going to roll with that until your works become manifest. And we'll know if you're really about this truth or you're not. We don't got to condemn you for that. God's foundation is sure, and he's going to know who are his. Come on. And let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth. 
and some to honor and some to dishonor. Right. And even if you're not creeping in as the other nations is the example I gave them, it says in every great house. Remember, I said the houses of Israel will be one house, be one nation. He says some are vessels of honor, some are vessels of dishonor. And the reality is, brothers and sisters, you look to your left, right, front, back, not everybody in here is called to make it. Many are called, but few are chosen. Not everybody in here is chosen. I might not be chosen. We got to always be mindful of that. We got to always, if God don't, we don't. Every generation come through, we forget. That's it. So, so if you if you endure this until you see Christ return, right, and you get taken up, nuclear fire don't burn you, or you die in this and you see what Stephen saw, then you then you know you're good. And then if there's another regeneration, you're gonna forget. And you got back to it all over again. All right. Uh that was it on verse 20. Let me get first Peter 1 and 7. First Peter chapter 1, verse 7. That the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth. Though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. That's what we want. Our whole life, once you, once you, most high brings you into this, once he calls you into repentance, that's what you're going to live through, the trial of your faith. Day in and day out, from moment to moment, on and on. And it says that trial of your faith is much more precious than any gold. That, because even gold will perish. But if you if you if your faith endures during during all these ups and downs that we're going through, right? When I say trials, I'm talking about real trials, right? I'm not talking about you lost your job, right? I'm not talking about loved ones passing. Those are you know what that's called? That's called life. That's called things that happen in general. Whether you Israel or not, stuff like that happens. Right? The trials of your faith is anything that's gonna try to separate you from this. And if you endure in this, and if you do, it says that's more precious than gold, because even gold passes away. Come on. And it says you might be found unto praise and honor and the glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. It's that second part. So you got the part where you may die and see what Stephen saw or you get the glory and praise at the appearing of Jesus Christ. This is what we try through. Trials of your faith on God's term, not ours. He knows what's his. And don't take for granted, especially you brothers, all right? The role that we've been called to in the apostles' ministry with the foundation that they made as husbandmen, as stewards of God. Right? Just like Christ said, don't offend these little ones, right? It's better that you put a stone around your neck, a great millstone, and be tossed into the ocean than to offend the little ones. We got to be mindful because we saw what happened. The Pharisees, they, they have, listen, they're here again today, and they're going to be ground to power when Christ returns at the appearing of the Son. And we don't want that type of judgment. Right? So I pray all of y'all get some understanding from this, all right? We used to scream black power while Heron was pushed. But at the end of the day, nothing's in vain. IUIC has been given a vision. The tents of Judah has risen. Many has attempted the mission. Minor murmuring, omitting, and missing the mark. Just reading that he had the flame of fire in his eyes gave us the spark. We on Paul's mission. We out on the road, purple and gold. From Mexico, Cuba, Haiti, Ghana, Sierra Leone. 144,000 boots banging, concrete crackling. These are how we men repented at heart. The scriptures is proof. IUIC, we deliver the truth.